for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right. Welcome, Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. How you doing? It's Monday. October 8th, 2018, 284 days into the new year, just 81 days left. As always, we are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California, and I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planets. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Tonight is night number one of our Egypt week here on Fade to Black. Get ready. Oh, yeah. It's going to be amazing, too, because tonight we're going to kick it off with my new Save Zade. He is here to talk about a new report that was published today about new chambers in the Great Pyramid and how to find them. Oh, yeah. Now, this is what is great about this week on Fade to Black. Three nights, Egypt week, three first-time guests. Tonight is Manu. Tomorrow night, the legendary, right here on Fade to Black. Christopher Dunn is here, and it is about time. Christopher Dunn joins us tomorrow night. Wednesday night, artist Brad Clausen is going to be here. That's right. Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Metallica, Nine Inch Nails. That, Brad Clausen, is going to be here on Wednesday night. We're going to talk about art, uh, symbolism, ancient Egypt, and, and a little rock and roll, too, as well. All of that is going down Wednesday night. Three nights, three first-time guests, Egypt week here on Fade to Black. It's going to be an extraordinary time here. Uh, all week long. And then, of course, Thursday nights, you know, the Fader Night open lines all night long. There you go. That's our week here on Fade to Black. Follow us over on OnStellar, OnStellar.com. It's simple enough. Go and register. Send us a firm request. OnStellar, the uh, next great social media platform built for you. Also, you can follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Again, simple enough. Right now, right before the show, let me let me take a look at this. CWB Hermes just posted this picture on Twitter in Croatia, repping fade to black right there in Croatia. How cool is that? Man? They got a retweet wearing a fade to black hat right there. Look at the castle in the background. That is just too cool. So uh, there you go. Thank you for that. And that will always get a retweet. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. And uh, you will uh, get, man, look at <laughs> Tweet Deck is blipping. Blah, 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 blah. We use uh, Tweet Deck over here and it, it loads automatically when anybody tweets. You can use hashtag F2B for the sandbox. 
uh, hashtag F2BQ for fade to black questions, everything live during the show. And, of course, we have two chat rooms, one in Spreaker and one over at KGRA. You can also email throughout the show, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. All right, let's get the show cracking. Breaking news. Last night, SpaceX successfully launched a Falcon 9 rocket over California. And, yes, we posted pictures and videos of the light show on social media. Why? Because last night, Rita and I arrived down in Irvine. We went down to the uh, Portals of Ascension uh, conference um, Sunday night, last night. And so we pull up uh, to the hotel right next to the airport down there. And around 7.15 p.m., jump out of the car and waiting to valet. And I look up, and there it is, the launch. It had just happened. I spin around to read it. I'm like, check that out. And it was right as the stages separated, right early on. It just happened. And it just filled up the sky. It was incredible. So I you know, grabbed my cell phone, and I'm videotaping, so was Rita. And it was pretty crazy to see. I know that, and what was funny, the traffic is driving by the airport, and we're out there filming, and nobody knows what's going on above and behind them. They have no idea. And it just lit up the whole sky. And we watched it from beginning to end. And it kind of turned, too, as well, because it was heading south. And then it it kind of turned and then then went up. But it was pretty wild. I thought, okay, now who's going to think this is a UFO? Um, today watching, I didn't get a chance to, you know, uh, hang out on social media. We were at the conference last night, but today the photographs, they were coming in from all over the place. And so this was seen up and down the West coast. That's the first thing. The second, it was uh, seen all the way into Arizona and New Mexico. It was uh, it was pretty dramatic, pretty cool to see. And we just happened to. Get out of the car at that moment. Had we uh, been another five minutes uh, early or late, we wouldn't have seen it. If we got there a little bit earlier, we would have walked into the hotel and missed it like everybody else did. Or if we were late getting to the hotel, we would have been in the car driving through traffic. We would have missed it. But we happened to get out of the car right at the right time. It's pretty cool. SpaceX last night. Now, uh, really big news today. Really big news, and in case you missed it, that's why you are here. Because after a strange series of events that included an undisclosed data breach, Google will now shut down, is shutting down Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus will be no more. Google made the news official today in a blog post, largely... Uh, The blog was about a new internal privacy initiative, and it's called Project Strobe. Well, Google decided to shut down Google Plus after the discovery that a software glitch, this is Google, a software glitch gave developers access to detailed data about its users all the way back from 2015 until March of this year. Nearly 500,000 Google Plus users, which is probably all there are, by the way, could have everything from their full names to their home addresses up for grabs. And although Google found no evidence that any of that information was misused, and as soon as you hear that, well, you know that it was, um, Google never publicly disclosed the data breach at the time of its discovery. No, they didn't do it. Very interesting. Well, Google Plus is no more. I know that we had a fade to black Google Plus page. I don't think we ever updated it or did anything with it. The only reason why it was there was because that with Google, with YouTube, with analytics and everything else, Google Plus was incorporated into all of that. And everything was tied together. So you didn't really have a choice but to... Start some kind of page. I haven't been to our Google Plus page in in probably a couple of years. Um, I know that it existed and we put up graphics and and whatever, but we just you know nobody ever talked to us about Google Plus or any users out there. So 
uh, I know that it just struggled along, but I guess now I, and this was the other thing I couldn't get, I didn't even go and check I didn't even go and see if uh, Google plus was shut down today. If they shuttered it already, but um, I couldn't get any o- official information on the timeline of this. If they just shut it down today or if it's going to happen over time, I don't know. So if anybody wants to tweet any information out there that you found out about Google Plus and, and what, what the timeline is for that, let me know. And you can post it up there on Twitter, and I will certainly uh, retweeting it. Google, it was nice knowing you. Yeah, the biggest company in the world. Yeah, and we'll, we'll see how this uh, pans out. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Just $2 per month. Very simple. Go to the podcast banner over at uh, jimmychurchradio.com. $2 a month, and you get over 900 archive shows right there. You can also become a fade or not. Uh, go help support the show. Go to our membership section on the site where you – it depends on what you want to do, but you can get commercial-free downloadable archives. You can get shirts and hats and all of that stuff. You get a private email to me. And I pretty much answer every single email that comes in. That's right. Well, the ones that need a reply, even the ones that don't need a reply, I still go, dude, right on. Do that. So cool. You'll even get that. All right. And you can do all of that in our membership section on the site. Ah, where am I? Don't forget about all of our sponsors here at Fade to Black. The way that this show cranks out every single day is from our sponsors, from our advertisers. They are amazing. They have been with us for a very long time. The products are stuff that I use. And uh, not only that, you use Rita, my family, I'll co everything, you know, the Fade to Black team. Uh, It's what we do here. So visit all of our sponsors. Okay, let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today, one of my favorites. I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it now. I don't care. Bruno Mars is 33 years old. Happy birthday, Bruno. Matt Damon, I'll say it too. Matt Damon today is 48. And if you haven't seen Deadpool 2, you need to go and see it. It's a it's a great movie. Um, but there is a scene that Matt Damon, heavily make right? You may not know it's Matt. He's sitting on the back of a pickup truck uh, with his buddy. I think they're fishing or are they hunting. I don't know what they're doing. But that scene is cinema gold. The outtakes and are, are great because it's extended. And if you watch the director's cut of Deadpool 2, you get the full scene. <laughs> it is great. Matt Damon. All right. Chevy Chase today is 75. And also today, Sigourney Weaver is 69. On this day in history, OTD. No, Deadpool 1 is not better than Deadpool 2. Deadpool 2 slams Deadpool 1. Oh, I totally disagree. Totally disagree, John. Sorry. I got to call you on that one. I got to call you. Deadpool 2. And it's rare that a movie does that, but I think Deadpool 2 is just, it's unbelievably great. On this day in history, OTD, 1967, Che Guevara is defeated in a skirmish with a special detachment of the Bolivian Army. Guevara was wounded, captured, and executed the next day. But his t-shirts were not. Seriously. All right. Fader fact. That, why is it that every year Che Guevara, <laughs> I talk about his T-shirts. It's so funny. You know, I don't even know if those wearing the Che Guevara T-shirts know anything about Che Guevara. <laughs> right? But they think the shirt looks cool, so they wear it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Safe. And then, then I make those comments, and then inevitably... The email comes flooding in. Whatever, man. It's still funny. All right. Fader fact. This is vetted. This is real. All right. The Russian. This is a fact. The Russians showed up 12 days late to the 1908 Olympics in London because they were using the Julian calendar 
instead of the Gregorian calendar. And I'm not making this up. That is your fader fact. All right, tonight, it's night one of our Egypt week here on Fade to Black. That's right. My new Save Zade is here. We're going to talk about a new report that was published today, written by him, about new chambers in the Great Pyramid and how to find them. There's a lot more uh, tonight with Manu that we're going to go through. It's going to be an unbelievable start to the week. Tomorrow night, right here, Christopher Dunn is finally on Fade to Black. Can you believe it? Christopher Dunn tomorrow night. Wednesday night, artist Brad Clausen is here. I can't believe this. Three first-time guests, three world-class guests, all discussing Egypt this week. We're going to close out the week with Brad Clausen on Wednesday night. Three nights, three first-time guests. Unbelievable. Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. Now, oh, man, I got to hit this coffee, River Moon Coffee. Fade to black blend. Also, Wednesday night, Brad Brad Clawson is here. I know you guys are, you know, I'll just say it now. How cool is it? That's that's my birthday, and I have Brad Clawson on the show. (laughs) Yeah, man, I love my job. What do we know today? What do we know today? About anything. Think about that for a second. And I know that I always say we know nothing. Nothing. And although that is actually true on every front, from ancient history to space and the universe, right? I mean, just big chunk of everything right there, we know nothing. What is happening is that the more that we discover, the more that we find out that we're not only wrong, right, but that we know less and less as we discover things. And I know it seems conflicting. I know that. But it's really true. Let me explain. Let me help you through this. This is everything that Fade to Black is about. This is how my brain works. The reason for this, nobody knows. I'm going to repeat that about five times tonight. The reason for this, nobody knows. I went back and checked my show notes from five years ago. My show notes. Because I was starting to think about the the, the numbers that I quote today. And I was like, well, you know, that's changed, right? So I went and looked at some numbers that were current at the time. And I would quote them. And one of them, and this is really strange, this is five years ago, one of them at the time was that there are 100 billion stars in our Milky Way. Yeah, five years ago. Now, if you check around, depending on the source, if you check around and you go back five years, just just go to the Wayback Machine and look. That was the number that was quoting. Today, Depending on the source, that number is around 500 billion and up, by the way, in our own Milky Way. You have to ask yourself, how could that be? How could that be? It doesn't make any sense, but that's actually the truth. Now, in our Milky Way, and the reason for this, I'll say it again, is that nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows how many stars are in the Milky Way. Every star has not been counted or named. Think about it. That would mean that there is a list somewhere compiled of 500 billion named stars. (laughs) And it doesn't exist. So nobody knows. But they are guessing about this. And I get that. I understand. But the more that we know about our Milky Way and the universe, and these numbers are increasing, the less that we know. We didn't know five years ago that there were 400 billion additional stars in our Milky Way, apparently. So the less, the more that we know, the less that we know. 
It's crazy. If you take this, this idea, this germ of an idea, and you take it to the next level, which is the planets in our Milky Way. That's right. If you take the same idea, you have the same issues in that the numbers have grown in the last five years. Now, there's lots of reason for this, but the main reason for this is that we just don't know. We don't know. Just five years ago, the amount of exoplanets that we were talking about today, we talk about 4,500 to 5,000. Next year, it'll be 10,000 to 20,000. It's going to grow exponentially. The year after that, it's going to be 20,000, 40,000 planets. You know, and with the D wave computer and quantum computing and the way that the computing is going to start to compile these numbers and crunch these numbers, the, it, it's going to get to an extraordinarily huge number very shortly. But 10 years ago, we were talking about 15 years ago, we were talking about 10 exoplanets. We just don't know. The amount of planets in the Milky Way now, and you have to remember, the rogue stars that are out there, just, it, you know, the, we look at our own solar system and we have, what, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 planets, right? We don't know for sure. But if each star out there has one planet or eight, now we are just talking about an extraordinarily huge number that we knew nothing about a short time ago. And as we move forward, we're finding out that we know less and less, not only about our own solar system, because now we're adding planets, our own Milky Way, right? And then we jump outside of that, and the same problems exist, right? When you expand out and you keep going, depending on who you listen to right now, different physicists and astronomers, they quote different numbers, but... Five years ago, it was 500 or 50 to 100 billion galaxies in our universe. Strange enough that it was the same number of stars in our Milky Way. Okay? Now they are saying today, depending on who you listen to speak or what papers, you, that there are 500 billion to a trillion galaxies in our universe. Now, how can that be? And we have the same thing applying here. Everything that I just said about our Milky Way, right, that there are not 500 billion named and cataloged galaxies. They, 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 it just doesn't exist. They are guessing. Now, think about how freaking large of a list you would have if you were compiling all of the stars in each of these galaxies <laughs> in our own and then the galaxies themselves. These lists, these numbers, think about how huge they would be. It's actually bordering on numbered insanity. It's crazy. If we reverse the same process and apply the same methodology to our own earth and history, we find out the same thing is happening right here. The more we learn, the less we know. It's crazy, I know, right? We know less and less as we look at the universe, our Milky Way. We know less and less, and we don't know what's causing the expansion. If it is expanding, if it's stationary, if it's shrinking, we don't. We, we just don't know. We don't know what those energies are. But if we reverse that and we bring it all back to Earth and go, go down to the atomic and subatomic levels, we know less and less there, too. The more that we find out, the more that we learn, we find out that we just don't know. We don't. Quantum theory and quantum mechanics absolutely crushes everything today. It crushes everything. How is it possible? The more that we learn today with, with, um, with archaeology and history on our own planet, how is it 
that we don't know how our ancestors built a simple wall. Sure, albeit with huge multi-ton blocks, but we don't know how it got done. I'm telling you, we know nothing, and that's on our own planet, let alone the universe. We actually don't have any idea. It's all guesswork. It is. There's nobody that can tell you how these stones were quarried, how they were moved, how they were transported, how they were carved, how they were fitted. Nobody knows. They don't. I'm not talking about a simple brick wall in front of your house. I'm talking about something that our ancestors built, and we don't understand. So the same, the very same mind work looking at the universe applies right here on Earth. The more we learn, the less we know. And these are exciting times. Tonight, um, Manu uh, Saves Vade is here. And some of the most important work of the last 25 to 30 years, going back to Shock, John Anthony West, of course, Robert Baval, and uh, and Graham Hancock, and others, Randall Carlson. Some of this work, Manu has been at the center of it. And the ideas that have been presented over the last 30 years are not only some of the most exciting, but they are starting to come to pass. We are starting to figure things out. Everything that we thought we knew is now changed. Everything is getting turned upside down. And as we move forward here with the work of Manu and others, we're starting to find out uh, the answers to these critical questions about our very own past. That either the answers have been there all along and they've been held from us, or... They didn't know, and we are starting to fill in those blanks. But these are very, very exciting times, and this is exactly why we do Fade to Black right here. So this is this is night one of Egypt Week here on Fade to Black. It's going to be a great night every single night, three nights, three world-class first-time guests, and I cannot wait to get to the end of the week to Fader Night so we can sit around with all of you and talk about these shows that are about to go down this week. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Manu saves Vade. Tomorrow night, right here, Christopher Dunn. Wednesday night, Brad Clausen is going to be here. And, of course, Thursday night is Fader Night with open lines all night long. It's Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, you can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio, and I'll be right back with our guest, Manu Saves Vade. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe.
This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Times are changing. The circus of politics, healthcare's low standards and high prices, and let's not forget food quality. What to do? Arm yourself with life change tea at getthetea.com. In a world of chemical imbalance and poor air and water quality, it's time you make a move. Log on to getthetea.com and stock up on organic non-GMO supplements. Don't forget the tea. Cleansing your body never felt so good. And we have a brand new tea called Take Down Tea, which helps support healthy glucose. All natural body support so you can be at your best naturally. All you have to do is log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. We're not a fad that comes and goes. We are the real deal. Join us and armor up. Getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Changing America's health one teabag at a time. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find Fast Start Diet on Amazon or go to faststartdiet.com and use promo code TALK to get 10% off your first box. And as a special bonus, Fast Start will include their number one rated Lipo 3 Appetite Suppressant Spray free with your order. This is Jimmy Church. And whatever your diet plans are, do what I did. Go to faststartdiet.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to jimmychurchradio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. Tonight, night one of Egypt week here on Fade to Black. That's right. Tonight, Manu Saves Vade is here. Tomorrow night, Christopher Dunn joins us. And then Wednesday night, Brad Clausen is here. It's going to be an amazing week. Tonight, it is Manu. Manu Saves Vade is a Persian and German descent. He's a practicing dermatologist here in Southern California, has a background in physical sciences, trained in microbiology and molecular genetics. He became interested in Egyptology after reading Robert Baval's The Orion Mystery, like most of us did. Manu's book, and I can't even say it, by the way, but is the idea behind the architectural design of Khufu's Great Pyramid. It deciphers how the timing of the most sacred celestial objects observed by the ancient Egyptians first became geometry and then the core design of the most famous monument in the world, the Great Pyramid. The conclusion is unmistakable. Manu has co-authored articles with Robert Schock and Robert Baval, where they explore the true origin of the Great Sphinx, a quest that led them all to yet another ancient Egyptian creation story and the code that started it all. His website is cheopspyramid.com, and I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Manu Sezvade. Manu, good evening. How are you? Hello, Jimmy. It's good to be here. Yeah, I, now, uh, just just for me... Say the title of your book. The Hanum Re Horachti Cycle. That's why I didn't say it. Nice. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just didn't want to uh I didn't want to do a perform an injustice here on the show. Right. But right. um the, this is the thing. Well, let's get one thing out of the way first. Uh you're a first time guest, so we've got to do the first time guest disclaimer. Sure. So let's do that, which is 
Manu, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. You yeah. ready? You got a deal. Now, um, uh, first off, you're here in Southern California. You were uh, hanging out with Robert Schock this weekend at the Portal to Ascension Conference down in Irvine. We were right. there last night. We missed each other, and I, I just cannot believe. I called Robert yesterday, right, on the way down, mm-hmm. and uh, Katie Oh, we're coming down. Let's hang out. Let's, you know, let's, you know, and, and it turns out they were already on a plane, uh, back to Boston and, right. and, and we missed them and we missed you and we were so close. Right. <laughs> but I know we just passed each other, but we'll catch up next time. Yeah, we certainly will. And I, and I look forward to it. Um, now th- this is the thing. Um, and I, I I'm going to start, we're going to go backwards before we go forward. So let's, let's jump way back. Um, very few people, and I've had this conversation with Robert and Jaws, uh, John Anthony West, many times, but mm-hmm. very few people get an opportunity to change the world. And Robert and Jaws certainly did just that. They, did. they tipped, the earth shifted a degree on its, on its axis back in 1993. Mm-hmm. There's no question about it. Um, and this, these things help shape careers and, and people too, like yourself. But before that, cause we're going to come right back to that point before that, did you have a general interest in, in Giza and ancient history? Just, you know, just like a regular consumer of discovery channel, history channel, you know, I was, I, I I've, I've always been sort of interested in history, but Nothing even close to what I'm doing now. I mean, Jimmy, you have no idea. The last two years, it's a complete life changer. So, right. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, it's crazy. How did you, uh, how did the relationship start with, uh, with, you know, I like to say the boys, you know, the, the whole yeah. crew, you know, Jaws and Shock and, and Boval right. and, and Hancock and, yeah. you know, Randall Carlson, right? The, the unbelievable group. Uh, I had a, a panel. I mentioned this to you uh, before the show, but a couple of years ago at uh, Contact in the Desert, um, I hosted an ancient e- Egypt panel, ancient history panel, with mm-hmm. with Boval, Graham Hancock, Robert Schock, all on the same panel. <laughs> right. I mean, amazing. Yeah, to have the th- those yeah. three guys, and I think Linda Moulton. Four Horsemen. And, yeah, right, right, right. All there at the same time, and right. it was it was such an honor. But uh, how did your relationship start with them? Um, I went on a cruise uh, last year, heaven um, heaven to earth cruise to Croatia, mm-hmm. and uh, that's how I met Robert Buval and Graham Hancock. And it was a very nice setting, very private, maybe thirty five guests or so. And um, it was during that cruise that Robert, he was just coming out with Origins of the Sphinx, uh, which, by the way, is a fantastic book. Uh, without Origins of the Sphinx, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you tonight. Yeah, it's a great book. I have it here. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So he gave it to me. Um, and uh, and then I, you know, I, I read the book. I think it, it took maybe, I don't know, three days, four days. And I had the book read. And something caught my attention in that book. Um, and so... Robert and I, we, uh, you know, we sort of made a date for Contact in the Desert. And so I told him about something that I wanted to talk to him about. And we didn't have time to talk about it then. And so we postponed it to the next meeting, which just happened, I think it was three weeks later in Sedona. And that was a Cosmic Origins meeting. And uh, and that's when it happened. So we were sitting one morning over breakfast. There was, and that's also I met Robert Chalk, by the way. Um, that was the first time I met him. So we were sitting over breakfast, and I, I presented this, and I think it didn't take more than a minute for me to get this out. And and then there was just this amazing moment, you know, when time slows down and you feel like you're in slow motion, and you can hear every single beat of your heart. Sure. And we were looking at each other, and. We just knew we have something, and um, and that became the Mahit paper. It came out a couple of months later, and uh, that's kind of how things started. Now, how were you able to? This is a very serious question, too, um, and I'm sure you've thought about this. 
how are you able to have them take you serious when you're a dermatologist? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. it's not like you have uh, these credentials, you know, that you were digging out in the sand, you know, right. for the last 20 years as an archaeologist or some Egyptologist or or any right. of this. How did you get them to take you serious? Well, let me just up the ante real quick. You know, Robert Bouval has sort of a, a rule. You have to get it out in 30 seconds. Otherwise, it can't be, you know, it's not. It has to hit you over the head uh, yes. in the first moment. It That's has to right. be that good. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this happened because I posted something on Facebook. And, you know, Robert and I are Facebook friends, uh, you know, with Robert Schock, Robert Bouval. And I think he saw it and it somehow it caught his attention. I mean, you have to ask him. That's probably the best way. But I think from my perspective, that's how it happened. He saw it on Facebook. And then so he had some time to mull over it. And then when we met at Contact in the Desert, um, you know, he actually told me, he wanted to hear about this. And we didn't have time. It was a busy meeting. As you know, you were there. Um, and so we postponed it. And so it then it basically happened a few weeks later. What is it? Uh, let's talk about some singular things here. Um, when we look at, um, because all of them, which, and I find this unique, all of them have their own approach uh, right. to looking at Giza. Some of it conflicts. Some of it overlaps, but all of it suggests that either we are being lied to, there's suppressed information, or that historians don't know anything anyway, right? So, yeah. I mean, but but that's, so for each one of them, let's start with Baval. What's the one thing that uh, he brings to the table uh, for you? He has, yeah, he has an eye for things that it's just amazing. Um, he, you know, I mean, this is Origins of the Sphinx, for example. I was reading that and um, he was talking about, I don't, you know, I, I, I want people to read it because I can't do it justice talking about it, but I'll just give you one little sample. Um, he was talking about the dream stealer uh, between the paws of the Sphinx and he, that is an, it, it is an important observation that basically is part of his argument that he develops in that in those chapters and i had looked at the stila i don't know 10 15 20 times mm -hmm. and that never never occurred to me and you know this is the this is what he does he just has this ability to just grasp something and it's sometimes it's really it's really simple and elegant but nobody sees it it's just you know like the or orion correlation theory he was camping out in the desert and he looks up in the sky and he sees he sees the belt stars and he says, oh, my God, that's Giza, mm -hmm. you know. And, I mean, there must have been, you know, there's thousands of years or let's say 2,000 years of people that have looked up in the stars and nobody's ever thought about this. And that's, that's what he brings to the table. He has that amazing, you know, brilliance about himself that he can just see something through all the – the web and the haze and he just nails it what and was the uh, what amazing. was what was the point that he brought out about the dream stella he um he well there are two there are two sphinxes on the dream stella and there are uh in front of each depiction is uh you know the image of Thutmose the fourth and, you know, Egyptologists, they look at that and saying that's just, art, you know, artistic symmetry that you show two sphinxes. And Robert picked up something very interesting on the, um, you know, on the northern sphinx. So on the right side, basically, he, he noticed that there is a libation icon. So Tatmos is actually, you know, sort of pouring water into uh, a vase. And he made a connection between that and something on the Dendera uh, Zodiac, uh, which is a depiction of Aquarius, Hapi. That's right. In ancient Egyptian. And, uh, and from there, he launches this incredible argument. Um, and it's just mind-boggling. I, I would have never been able to, to figure that out. But he did. The uh, uh, how, I kind of want to stay on the dream stella for a second, and then we're going to move on. The what I find interesting about that, well, first off, the second sphinx. But if we take what we do know about the dream stella, um, and and what we know about the great sphinx, it's quite simply, and this gets lost so much in the discussions. 
uh, but the Sphinx was buried. And not right. only was it was it buried, but nobody for uh, a, a couple of thousand had no clue what was underneath the sand. They just right. thought it was this head that was sticking up, and they walked by it every day, and nobody thought about That's digging. Right. right? Well, yes. if you just take that simple thought and and consider a second sphinx and look at the Giza Plateau— you don't have nobody has any idea what's underneath that sand and the possibility of a second sphinx being buried somewhere out there probably on the west side of the great pyramid that's my guess but yeah. um uh, nobody knows and it's it's, right. it's it's that you can't say that there's only one sphinx you don't know you don't know that is fact you just right. simply don't and that's what i get out of the dream stella and i've always had that one singular thought you know, there's a reason why there was a there's two sphinxes mentioned many times too. It's not just on yes. the dream Stella, but right. but we don't know what's out there on the west side or or f- for many square miles around uh, the uh, pyramid complex where there could be a second sphinx. It only makes sense. Right, you're absolutely correct. Uh, there are actually depictions of a double-headed sphinx with a you know a common like a chimera, a common body, two heads. And they depict sort of the uh, you know the underworld, and you know one entry is in uh, is on the west side, and the other entry is on the east side, and that is exactly uh, consistent with what you're saying. And so you know, next time you talk to Robert, you should uh, that's a great topic for a discussion. Of course, Robert is proposing that the second sphinx is sphinx is in the sky. So the dream Stella is showing one sphinx on the ground. And one is in the sky, and the one in the sky is Leo. And that's how he develops the theme in Origins, um, you know, that that the whole Giza Plateau is basically a shrine um, to another time, you know, Zeptepi. Um, but the new, the new idea that comes out in the book, and I don't want to give it away because I want you guys to read it, um, is that it ties in with, um, you know, dating – the whole complex and so uh and so it's crucial that that connection that he makes that the second sphinx on the dream stealer is is maybe a sky sphinx now let's let's go to uh shock and and jaws i love saying that too by the way shock and jaws <laughs> yeah. uh with those two we can do it as a pair or individually what is it that uh shock brings to the table yeah he is so the you know the thing is i think egyptologists were sort of in their comfort zone, they used they were archaeological evidence. This is what they go by, you know, pot charts and and inscriptions. And then here comes a geologist, and he confronts them with some hard physical data, and they're not used to that. Um, and so it just turned everything upside down in the early nineties. When uh, and it's not just one tech; it's not one. You know, observation. It's two independent observations that corroborate each other. So you have the ge- the, the geology on uh, on you know what you see on the outside of the stones, but then you also have the geology under this you know inside of the stones under the surface, the decay, and and these are completely different ways of dating stone decay, and they corroborate each other. And this is just you know, that's amazing. And it's difficult to, you know, to slip out of that, uh, out of that hold, that, that evidence. Um, and, you know, I mean, there is a debate and I, I don't, I want to be even handed about it. I've looked, I'm, and I'm looking at this as a layman. I'm not a geologist. I, I'm just looking at it from, you know, like you and I, um, re- looking at the data. And I think, you know, there is a good discussion to be had. There is a debate to be had. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's a compelling case for more studies, and this is my my beef with uh, you know Egyptology that we haven't been allowed to do that. No, it, and the, I don't know what the reasons are. It we we debate it every day. You know, is it suppression? Is it that they don't know? Why is it yeah. that they're they're trying to keep uh, some of the fringe thoughts and ideas? Uh, right. From being investigated, you know, we can we can debate that you know this big conspiracy of the education system, but what the powers that be, and wait, we, yeah. we, you know, that can go on forever. But sure. the, the facts are, um, as we look at it today, and the more that we learn about our own history, is that 
The Sphinx is is much much older. The Giza complex is much much older. The the pyramids um, are bringing uh, more questions than answers every single day, and we're discovering right. stuff every day. And it's like still, I yeah, the, like I said yeah. in the opening statement, and I really mean this: the more that we learn, the less that we know. And that's that's yes. that's really the truth. That's how it should be. You know, it should be. That's how science. I mean, I, you know, Jimmy, I come from a science background where these type of personality. I mean, you have personality conflicts, but it's just not not even close to being that way. You know, I mean, you just if you have a dispute. OK, so you design an experiment and you try to settle the dispute. It's it's complete. You don't even think about arguing and quibbling over this opinion and that opinion. No, you just sit down and design an experiment to settle the issue. And in Egypt, in you know, in ancient history, in Egyptology, I understand you can't do that easily. You can't just do an experiment because you're basically dependent on evidence uh, to come out of the ground. But my contention is that there is a lot of evidence out of the ground that just hasn't been interpreted always, you know, in a sort of even-handed way. And um, because I'm not an archaeologist, I, I, you know, I'm not, I didn't look at anything that I uh, dug up. I basically looked at evidence that's been available for many, many years. And I see that the evidence is being interpreted with a certain slant. And when you take the slant out of the equation, you all of a sudden you start seeing other things. That's right. That's right. And yeah. I, I want to talk about John Anthony West. Um, yes. Now, and this is this is I'm not an archaeologist either. I'm not a professional anything. I'm a professional doofus that likes to ask questions. That's what I do. But I'll say this. You look at the Great Pyramid. You just look at it. You can look at all three, but you look at the Great Pyramid. And one thing and one thing only comes to mind. Ancient man, as we have been presented did not build that. That's it. That's the only conclusion that you can come to. If they want us to believe what ancient man was like at 3000 BC, that dude did not build that. <laughs> That's well, you it. have the right person coming to your show tomorrow. That is, <laughs> that is, he's probably one of the most forceful proponents of that. Yeah, it, that's that's it. Now, now, yeah. what, what, who, what, when, where, all of that, we can we can do, talk about that. But don't tell me that uh, ancient man at three thousand BC built that. It that, no, no, that's not that's not the game that we're playing here. Now, let's talk about John Anthony West since we're on this subject. What does for you? What does he bring to the table? He well, I actually had never had. Um, you know, and I never met him uh, for a discussion. I met him at at a conference, but we didn't have time. You know, I I wasn't able to sit down and discuss with him. Um, but he he's sort of the spiritual, you know, godfather of this entire movement. You know, um, he he, you know, when I say Robert Bouval has a certain way of seeing things, and Robert Chalk has this, you know, meticulous, detailed approach evidence-based, uh, you know, they all have their different styles. And John Anthony West is sort of the, you know, he has the vision, the long-term vision to interpret everything um, through a, just a completely different lens. Um, and so they all bring different things to the table. And, yeah, it's very inspiring. I mean, to me, I mean, these are all, I look at them, they're all teachers. They have different ways of teaching, and I can learn from all of them. Now, we're going to hit a break here, so let's set up for when we come back. You guys sit down and have breakfast, and this idea comes together for this paper. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, the – well, there's, there is uh, the uh, uh, the Mahit paper, which we published last uh, year, and there is, you know, there's already discussions going on. I'm, I'm noticing it, and I just wanted to add a little bit of context to that. Um, you know, uh, Robert Schock has he's, – he's taking care of the details, you know, in his presentations, and what I want to do is just uh, highlight a few things – to give a large perspective on how that that paper came together. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Let's start. So, um, 
Right. So the first thing I want to talk about is the, a little bit about the history of the Sphinx and specifically two things about the Sphinx that are controversial. The first thing, of course, is the age and who made it. And the second thing is what's underneath the Sphinx. Um, and so, so let me start with the second one first. So what's underneath the Sphinx? Uh, the buzzword here is uh, the Hall of Records. And when people you know, hear Hall of Records, immediately, you know, the camp divides into people that think that um, Edgar Casey made uh, a, a correct prediction, and then there's people that don't accept it, and they will reject the whole thing. And I want to sort of get past that. So, um, you know, Edgar Casey basically had three sessions when he predicted this, and uh, two of them in 1933 and one in 1941. Um, and he described basically a path to uh, a place where one of three places in the world where there were records from Atlantis. And um, but even long before Edgar Casey, there was there were there was a rumor mill, and it goes all the way from through the Arab historians to the Roman historians, maybe maybe even Plato, uh, where you where they they are saying that there's something under the Sphinx. And it's basically two types of stories. Either it's a grave, somebody's buried under the Sphinx, or it's, uh, or it's some kind of archive. And um, so, and what I just, you know, I just wanted to clarify that our paper goes way, way past all of this time frame. This time frame that I just described is maybe 2300 years long so we go back to plato's time 300 bc let's say 360 bc when he published timaeus and our paper goes another 2200 years past that to you know the old kingdom of egypt our evidence the evidence that we're presenting is from that time 4500 years ago it has nothing to do with this entire, you know, rumor mill about a hall of records. And by the way, I think Edgar Casey made some amazing predictions. Um, and he may well be right about this, but I just wanted to clarify that in this paper, we are not talking about any, any stories, any evidence that were created in the, generated in the last 2300 years. Right. Yeah. The um uh okay, let's take a break. Actually, let's pick up uh right where there's too much to go to in the next 60 seconds. Let's take a break <laughs> right here and uh, we'll just pick up right where we left off. Our guest tonight, Manu Saves Vade. We're talking about the pi- paper that was just published today. We'll cover that in a, in 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 a little bit. We're discussing his first paper that was published with Robert Schock and Robert Paval. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black, night one of our Egypt week. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. Our CBD is made from hemp and has 0.003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied, but you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with (laughs) You fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people one by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Hello, I'm Kakini, and you're listening to my very man, Jim. 
Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Hobbs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We're the... <laughs> Just... We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Reclaim your active lifestyle with Angioprim. Angioprim is the original liquid oral chelation supplement. Chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in your veins and arteries that can cause blockages. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. Find out more. Go to angioprim.com. Talk to a trained consultant by calling Angioprim toll-free, 877-882-7221. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fade or not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hey, it's Grace. Can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. <laughs> Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Night one of our Egypt week here on Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Manu, saves our day. Talking about, uh, okay, we're talking about two different papers here. One that was published uh, two years ago and one that was published last, pu- year. Uh, last, last year. year. Last year. And then yeah. one that was uh, published just today, and we'll get to that uh, in just a bit. And we, right. were t- we were talking about uh, two points on the Sphinx, and I want to stay on the uh, the dating concept here. Um, when we uh, when we look at the year of uh, ten thousand five hundred BC, that uh, this date has been uh, uh, it's it's been connected from a few different points. One, of course, Baval's dating along with uh, Graham Hancock. Uh, that deals with celestial alignments of Orion right. and, of course, uh, right. Leo um, yes. at 10,500 B.C., right there, right between the paws, facing Leo, and then on the backside, Orion perfectly aligns with the ground. Right. Okay, so there's that part. And then it just so happens of the dating of the, of the rainfall and the erosion of what uh, uh, Shock and Jaws brought forward in there, they came up with the same date. Now, that's right. pr- that's pretty compelling evidence right there. I think it's I older. I, I think it's older myself. Right. Uh, so. Well, it could be. I, and, you know, I, I was in Egypt last week, um, and I, uh, you know, I stood in front of the rock that, um, that was carved during Kafir's time, and I, I was by the Sphinx. And it's, it's like night and day. I mean, it, you can't 
the, the, the erosion around the Sphinx and the erosion on the very same rock that is maybe 100 meters to the south is you can't compare it. It's completely different. So you, I don't, you, know, you don't even need numbers. You just look at it and you just know. It's not possible. It's not. It's not. No. So uh, let's let's talk about that for a second. Uh, you did just get back from Egypt. Uh, what right. were you doing out there? I, you know, I was actually doing a little bit of research, you know, which means that I walk around in the plateau and look for things that normally as a tourist you wouldn't look for. And just to get some ideas, take some pictures, you know. So kind of that for two weeks, I was I was up there maybe five times. I went to the museum a couple of times. And, uh, you know, that's how I get ideas, look at evidence, another, you know, over again. And um, who knows, maybe another paper will come up in the next few months. Who do you use for a guide when you're out there? Um, we did have a guide a couple of times, but mostly I didn't need a guide. Um, a couple, a couple of times I was with a man called Assam. He's fantastic. Um, and he was set up by the touring company that I used and, um, you know, we have great discussions. He speaks great English. Um, and, and he was with us for five days. We went to Dashur. We went to, uh, um, uh, we went to the Maidum pyramid. Um, and so, you know, a couple of those trips, he was with us. Now, uh, when you stand at the Sphinx, um, or no, actually uh, I'm asking the question wrong. When you go to the different temples and, and monuments out there in the different complexes, is there one that you're spirit, spiritually connected to? Abu Sir. Really? Okay, so t- yeah. tell me tell me how you came to that conclusion. I, I love is, asking this it is question. It's the most peaceful place I've been to. And well, I mean, uh, is there did you have a revelation when you set foot? I I felt, you know, there's two places in Egypt that I had this feeling. The first one was last year when uh, I went with Alan Green, who you of course know. Mm-hmm. Um Alan and I went to um Karnak and I went to Hatshepsut's uh inner sanctum and I felt something amazing looking at her reliefs and the inscriptions. It was incredible. Um and I had that same feeling this trip when I went up the uh causeway to see um, the pyramid of Sahura. Her, her, her amazing. complex is just ginormous. I, I still, yes. I, you know, I haven't been to Egypt yet. We're going to go next year. But when I see that in pictures, I, I, I always come to the same conclusion. How, you know, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculously huge. I mean, it's right. just, it's just beyond words, isn't it? Right. Yeah, it's a big complex. That's right. And as you go up, you know, you feel like it gets ever more private. And when you get all the way into her inner sanctuary, you uh, there's this relief with her, you know, caressing uh, Hathor, the cow in 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 the cow shape. Uh, and it's just something about it. Now, um, uh, you brought up the Dream Stella. Now, the, although the Dream Stella is important, and there's a lot of things that are there, and it's and it's the original, and you can see it, and it's right there, it's between the paws. But I don't think that's the important one. I think the inventory Stella is is where the the crucial information is. Yes, yeah, the inventory Stella. So this is, of course. A big subject, and one of these days when we have another chat, then we'll talk about the inventory. So Robert Schock and I just published a paper um, basically countering the current mainstream view that it's uh, it's historical fraud, um, meaning that the stela was produced in the late period, but the story on the stela is, is not a true story. But it is, um, it is basically... The one explicit evidence that exists that Khufu knew the Sphinx, and in fact he repaired it, and um, and it also says that he built his pyramid. So, and Egyptologists are basically dismissing this whole thing as um, a way for the priests to attract business to the Temple of Isis, which is right by you know Hinutsen's pyramid, you know the Queen Pyramid that's mm-hmm. the southernmost of the three. Um, And, you know, the temple was built and the priests produced the stela and the Egyptologists are saying that this was a way to get donations. And we are thoroughly, I mean, it's a 60-page paper, Jimmy. I don't think there's ever been a paper written in this much detail taking down 
the the current view on the stila and robert and i published this just a few months ago it hasn't gotten that much attention which i understand it's very very detailed there's a lot of language analysis in there and of course there is going to be pushback and debate which i completely expect um but we wanted to you know we wanted to start a different type of discussion we don't want to have you know the field just dismiss the stila as fraud and when there is a lot of holes in that argument and we point out all those holes in this paper now the inventory stella um it's my understanding that it's not even on public display it's locked up right no, no, it is. Uh, and But, you know, it's funny you say that. I couldn't find it in the museum, so I actually I went to one of the guards, and believe it or not, he introduced me to the director of the museum, which <laughs> I wasn't asking for that. But, okay, here he is, a very nice gentleman. And so he he didn't quite know in the beginning, and because he didn't, I don't think he understood the English word, inventory, Stella. But he eventually we found it, and he was actually really surprised when I told him what it says. And um, that doesn't mean that I convinced him, but uh, he he didn't know that the text says that Khufu knew the Sphinx. Well, he also, I I, I don't know if I misheard you, but the inventory Stella also says that Khufu repaired the Sphinx, but he also repaired the pyramid. I don't think he says that he built the pyramid. I think he says that he was there for repairs. Well, this is okay. So this gets into very detailed language analysis, and um, I we should probably reserve this for another talk, Jimmy. But just to give you the short answer, uh, if you look at the the, the specific text, the hieroglyphical the hieroglyphic expression for building versus rebuilding. Okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so rebuilding, you have to add a symbol which is the foot of a donkey, believe it or not. I know that's kind of funny, but the foot of a donkey means, has the phonetic value of uhem, and uhem means to, to again or repeat. So when you, when you use the word build and then you add that symbol behind it, that means rebuilding, okay? Got it. So, so that is one part of the stella which which pertains to the Temple of Isis. So Khufu repairs the Temple of Isis. But the other part of the stella where he talks about building his pyramid, it only uses the verb build. So you don't have that modification behind it. And so based on that, I would say we do have a positive control in the same text uh, that tells us when it's supposed to mean rebuilding and when it's supposed to be building. So based on that, I would have to conclude that if I take it at face value, that Khufu built a pyramid. But it doesn't mean necessarily, you know, there is, a, there is still um, a way to basically uh, combine the two fields. So I think there is an, a prehistoric, there was a prehistoric site and Khufu built on top of it. Now, where you draw the line, okay, so you can debate that, but I think you are right. Those monuments, there was something there, and by the way, Robert Bouval, of course, has also entertained that, that there was something there before which aligned with Zeptepi, the three, the three positions, mm-hmm. and then came the Old Kingdom kings, and they built their pyramids on it, uh, and they basically just built right on top of those structures, and which is why the orientation is locked in the same way. Now, you just said something that we don't uh, mention often on the show, and it needs to be not only mentioned, but clarified. You just said Zep Tepe. Uh, right. t- t- tell everybody, this is such, such an important term in Egyptology. Uh, what is Zep Tepe? Zep Tepe, you know what? Zep Tepe would be sort of the the biblical equivalent of Genesis. So it's the, it's the first time when the gods ruled Egypt, and it was a time of harmony, uh, and but then there was also a conflict, um, which happened in uh, year 363, according to the uh, Edfu texts. And dur- in, during and in that year, there was a, a battle, an epic battle between good and evil, Horus and Seth. And Horus wins the battle. Um, and all of this is also very nicely presented by Robert Bouval in Origins of the Sphinx. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, he goes through all the, the, the myth and how it may have been enshrined at the Giza Plateau. Um, so, uh, but that's what Zeptepi is. It's the first time when the gods ruled and then they passed their world onto man. 
So when, and in the Ed Food Tax, and this is for the audience, but we it really needs to be clarified. In the Ed Food Tax, they mentioned Zep Tepe. Right. So that is pushing the dating back. You know, this is now the time of the gods, or the, even the time before the gods, right? It's, it's the first yes. day. It's the first of everything. Right. Um, now, how long of, uh, uh, of a period of time are we actually talking about here? We don't know. It could be thousands of years. It could be 10,000 right. years. It could be 20,000 years. It could be 50,000 years. But yeah. they certainly make that reference there, um, and this is all in, clearly uh, stated in the Ed Food Building text. Yeah, and I think the, I think the reason why this is dated, um, textually dated to 10,000, let's say 500 BC, has to do with the flood, because there is a mention of a flood, um, and so based on that, you know, and then combined with the, the astronomy and the geology, I think all of this converges to this date, you know, 10,000 or 10,500 BC. Um, so maybe that's when Zep Tepe was. Well, and I find it interesting um, that pretty much i think every ancient culture on this planet has a flood myth everybody's right. got one and egyptologists would always say well yeah except for for egypt we don't have a flood myth and they <laughs> they couldn't be further from the truth and right. It, it, it's right there in the edfu building text and right. it's it states that there was a a, a great flood at Zep Tepe, at the beginning. Right, there's even, and you know what, Jimmy, there's even a story from the Middle Kingdom, it's, 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 it's fabulous, it's, a, it's called The Shipwrecked Sailor, um, it was written in the Middle Kingdom, and it's, uh, really quickly, it's just a story of a sailor who got stranded on a lonely island, and there's a snake, and uh, the snake turns out to be a friendly snake, and the snake actually describes an event that wiped out its family, and this event was a falling star. Now, how is it that um, – can you read hieroglyphics? I, I am – yes. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe, let's say, early intermediate at this point. Well, you're, you're much better than I am, and I like the way that you, <laughs> you, you, know, you bring this up, uh, the, 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 the foot of a donkey, and phonetically versus a written version of, of the text. How good are you right. with it? Well, I think at this point I can maybe walk up to Estella and – sort of get the general idea. Um, and the next stage is, you know, to be able to read a wisdom text, um, something like that. And I'm still far away from that. So, but at least I have all the, I have all the pieces in place that I can sit down with the text and with a lot of time, I could figure it out probably. How did the, uh, how did hieroglyphics evolve, you know, versus what, do we, you know, what has been found at Abydos? You know, at three thousand BC, going back to right. Menes, you know, and and Narmer, uh, through uh, you know to Cleopatra's time, how di how did it evolve? Right, right. That's a great question, which actually pertains to our paper, the Mead paper. So there is the, uh, the this is by the way Wolfgang Helk is a German um, Egyptologist who uh, is fabulous. He 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 pieced this together. You know the first uh, three four hundred years of uh, of dynastic Egypt. So basically, you had two uh, you had two language centers. One was in southern Egypt. One was in northern Egypt. The southern uh, Egyptian language, uh, the very first documented evidence comes from Tum Uj, which is scorpion, um, and that's where the German Archaeological Institute found these little tablets, and they realized this is Gunter Dreyer, you know, who pieced this together. He said, this is a phonetic script. So what you hear is what it means, not what you see, but what you hear is what it means, just like our alphabet. Mm -hmm. And then contrast that with, uh, with the remnants of a script that was in the early Egyptian writings, which is, you know, we just have, you know, little tags and labels and those symbols, which came from northern Egypt, and that was maybe centered around Bhutto. So Bhutto was a prehistoric trading hub. You know, they were trading with southern Egypt. They were probably trading with, with the Levant, you know, maybe even with Mesopotamia. And so they were using a different script. And the, the main difference is that that script was uh, a visual script. It was pictographed. So you, what you see is what it means. And when... You know, Narmer took 
uh, conquered northern Egypt. Um, at least that's you know the current model that there was a conquest. Uh, they adopted that script and then they gradually phased it out. So over the first you know five pharaohs, gra- you still have initially you have these you have both scripts, you have both types of symbols, and then the pictographs gradually get phased out. But here's the here's the rub. The 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 symbol that we are describing in the meat paper, the lioness with the with the bent rod, that is one of those pictographic scripts from Buto, most likely, and this is Wolfgang Helk's uh, also conclusion, and it is not a phonetic symbol; it is a pictorial symbol. So what you see is what you get. The meaning of that symbol, most likely, is is an object somehow related to this lioness. So this is a key concept that I wanted to bring out uh, tonight because that, you know, we didn't have we didn't have uh, the paper. We had some space restrictions, so I wasn't able to, you know, add that. The paper would have gotten too long. So, but I wanted to make sure I explained that. Yeah, let's let's clarify that because when I look at and what uh, Manu is is talking about specifically is in the trading. Uh, that they were doing at 3000 BC, 2900 BC, the you know the first second uh, dynasty, uh, they would have little tabs uh, on uh, ivory and, and other, th- but that would right. have uh, information on it. It was the first right. written language. It might even actually predate Mesopotamia, um, and and some say that cuneiform was first, but uh, anyway. That yeah, they... that's that, that's exactly right. So Mesopotamian script before before it was, uh, you know, the cuneiform. It, uh, they also had a pictographic script, and you're absolutely correct. It is possible that with you know cultural exchange, that the the Buto script, the Northern Egypt script, may have may may have come from the early Mesopotamian script, and also vice versa. We vice don't versa. know. That's right. But there, is, right. A, there is a connection. There is a cultural, there is a linguistic connection potentially, yes. And so they would name the year. Now, this is what I find interesting. So they would name the year. They didn't have a number for the year, right? They didn't know that they were at 3000 BC. <laughs> they didn't that's have, correct. That, they, that's right. But they would name the year for whatever it is. Uh, Manu, uh, uh, Manu had a baby. So they called it Manu had a baby year, whatever that's it right. is. And that's they right. would put a picture of that on these tabs for taxation, for delivery, for a lot right. of different reasons but we are able to accurately date some of these years because they would name the years but also um i think and when i look at these uh specific tabs and how they marked it it looks like it was incorporated into the hieroglyphics that we we actually know and love that's, yes i think that's right so i think they are, merged yes. them and also there's a king you know there's a, the king name the name of the king is shown on that that's how we can date it right Right, yeah. right, right. I, I find it fascinating, and and to think also uh, about how long ago that we're talking about. It, we're, you know, the, we're talking about a very long time that yeah. they were actually uh, naming years, and how important it was to know what a year was in length, and then you would name that year and name the next year and the next year, and they were able to get an accounting system together and 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 and. It, it's just it's it's a mind blowing thing, but I think that, right. that that those pictograms that they use for that written language I think evolved in uh, partially into hieroglyphics. I think they ended up merging. Yeah, they, that's right. They were using initially, you know, uh, let's say under the first king Narmer, and then came uh, Hor Aha. So under Hor Aha and his son Jer, and then Jet, you know, during that early phase, uh, first dynasty. There, uh, the the buto symbols were side by side with the southern Egyptian symbols. You know, like the types of symbols discovered in Scorpion's tomb. And then gradually, as Den uh, Den is the main king, when there was must have been some kind of reform, uh, of reform, a language reform, because all of a sudden a lot of these buto scripts disappear, except for a few, and one of them is the the lioness with the bent rod. Now let's. Let, why is that important? 
Because uh, it has to do with how the state developed. So we so we just talked about language. So we also have to talk about economics and real quickly and then uh, and then the, uh, the, uh, the bureaucratic apparatus. So what happened in the beginning is you had a king basically traveling the nation, collecting his taxes. Uh, that was the very early phase. Um, and then what happened is the king started getting deliveries from from the regions and that's why you needed an accounting system and so in this very early phase you had uh, uh, as what Egyptologists call a scribe's tent and that tent of course is shown on some of these seals and we show that in the paper so you had a tent and that tent was the scribe's tent and in front of the tent you had the lioness with the bent rod so there's some association between the lioness the symbol and the scribes that were basically doing the accounting for the early um, state apparatus. Now, what is the dating of this lioness? Uh, well, she goes all the way back to Narmer, Jimmy. You can uh, you on Narmer ceiling. You should, you can already see her. Right. So yeah. that would be if I'm doing math here. If we go with traditional dating, which I don't buy, but if we go with traditional dating and we look at 2650 BC. For for Khufu, right. uh, we're talking four hundred years. Am I guessing this yeah. correctly? Yeah, you're, you're right on the money. Yeah, Khufu maybe twenty five fifty something like that. Right, um, and twenty six seventy would be Djoser. and then uh, but Narmer, let's say three thousand round number, let's say three thousand BC. Right. So yeah, yeah four hundred four hundred and fifty years. Yeah. Yes. Well, that that doesn't that throw the Khufu idea out the window. In terms of the uh, the lion, the Sphinx, the, or? Yeah, well, the, the first reference to a lion and the Sphinx, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's what we're saying. So we are, so you know, we see the lioness, we see the bent rod, and we know the name because on uh, on this uh, gorgeous stela. Now this is a fourth uh, dynasty stela, Wepem Nofret, and he was probably, from the looks of it, a sem priest, a shaman, shaman priest, um, and on his stela which is in the West Field, you see actually the name of the lioness, and her name is Mahit. And she's, you know, right there, very close to um, the dual title, which is what we're saying is the, you know, the chief scribe and the, the chief archivist. Now, we started off this conversation, I like where we just ended, but we started off uh, talking about what was underneath the Sphinx and what was underneath the paw. Right. So on that same stela, uh, it's uh, you know it's too bad we're on the radio we can't see it, but of course it's easy to look up. Uh, it, so I need to just preface this real quick with something. Egypt, there is more than a hundred uh, bureaucratic titles in in ancient Egypt: bureaucratic, provision, uh, court titles, academic titles, and so. What the Egyptians did when they, uh, when they, you know, basically inscribed their resume into their tombs, they they grouped these titles into these categories, kind of like a resume. You have different categories. They did exactly the same thing. They didn't just, you know, list these titles haphazardly. So, so let's go back to the Stella uh, Weponofred. On the Stella of Weponofred, there is a very nicely demarcated column where we have the dual title, which basically says that Weapon Nofred was the chief scribe and the chief of this, what we're saying, the archive of Meid. And right underneath is a line that I think should be the banner slogan for the alternative history movement, because it is the closest I think we're ever going to get to proof that there was a library. And so what this says, is says, uh, Hem Neter Seshat, uh, Chentet, Nesurech Meja. So what this basically says is that you have the chief scribe, the chief archivist of what? Of the Seshat uh, Royal Library uh, of Knowledge. Th that's kind of loosely how you can translate it. So there you have it. It's all in one nice column. You have an association between scribing and uh, between scribing, between arch archiving, and between a library. And it was a royal library, and it was associated with the goddess Seshat, which, of course, you know, is she was, uh, uh, you know, associated with writing and with astronomy. Let's take a break right here. This is an absolutely fascinating conversation. Our guest tonight, oh, got some noise on the line. 
Manu Saves Zade is here. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is night one of Egypt Week here on Fade to Block. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new Mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new Mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously. Go back, Lee Tappy. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Rhys Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Tonight is 
night one of our Egypt week right here on Fade to Black. Seems like we do it every week, don't we? Our guest tonight, Manu Safezade, is with us. And now, Manu, uh, discussing the previous paper and certainly uh, Shock and, and John Anthony West, um, they had found evidence of uh, uh, of uh, a space underneath the paw, which got completely shut down, you know, by uh, uh, the Egyptologists and Zahi Hawass, uh, yes, and and didn't allow that to be pursued. We can we'll save that debate for another show, but clearly uh, there is something underneath that paw. And what it is, uh, man, one day I hope that we will actually find out. But the other part of the great debate um, is the, and I like everybody's opinion on this. I ask everybody the same question. Why the total lack of hieroglyphics and evidence on the Great Pyramid? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, You know, I don't know. Uh, and it, you would think that they leave their mark. Um, so you could say, did, did, did they run out of time? Did they die before they had a chance to do it? Um, I, I don't, I just don't know the answer to that. I, I know that's one piece of evidence that, you know, you could say, well, maybe that those pyramids don't belong to that time. I, I understand the the rationale for it. I, I went inside Una's pyramid um, a couple of weeks ago, and there was something that I had never heard of and I had never seen it before. I mean, the pyramid texts are incredible, but the guard all of a sudden turned off the light and turned on his flashlight, and then he's then what we saw is amazing. Um, basically, a, a, the wall next to the sarcophagus has a texture, to a contour to it, and the contour is in the shape of... Uh, Sahu. Oh, really? Orion. Yeah. It's incredible. I, I posted this on, on my Facebook page, um, and uh, my cousin took a b even better picture of it, and I had never heard of this. And it confirms that Orion was seen as the entire, you know, as a, as, a, as a constellation, not just as a star, but as the entire figure, just like, you know, you see a thousand years later in the to tomb of uh, Senenmut and Seti, you know, you see actually uh sahu as a as a figure as a constellation but here you see it in una's pyramid and that's you know just two three hundred years after the great after the great pyramid supposedly was built well and but, you bring, I, but i don't really answer your question yeah you see you bring up a great point when we talk about unas or uh just about any other pyramid or monument in uh, all over egypt they didn't have any issues with <laughs> <laughs> writing yeah. with writing you yeah, know right. and it, it's everywhere it's everywhere yeah. every surface had something on it the, the valley of the kings you know everything had something on it every wall every ceiling every step right. every everything had something on it and you have an opportunity at, at the very least with the grand gallery or the king's chamber uh, yes. for, forget about the outside of it. Okay, whatever. The entrance doesn't mark enter here. I, I I get all of that. But the Grand Gallery, those are clean walls, just ripe, ready right. for just gloriousness. And they didn't do anything, nothing at all. No, uh, no they didn't. I ask an Egyptologist, I, you know, I go to seminars once a month, and um, there was a, an Egyptologist whose name I forget. So I apologize. He's fairly well known. And he said that he thinks that maybe the pyramid texts were written on papyrus uh, before, you know, before Unas. Um, and maybe that's a way you can explain it. Um, but, you know, we just don't know. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Well, the other, the other point, um, and when we bring up Howard Weiss, um, I, there's something in my gut that says to me that that, that that was there was some fabrication uh to his story and mm -hmm. and what yes. was done there now i think there's a lot of evidence today that has been brought forward to suggest not only in his character but also the opportunity because back then everybody mm -hmm. was trying to make a great discovery in egypt and he hadn't done his yet 
and but, suddenly he's finding all kinds of crazy things there. So you there, mean Scott? Because you mean Scott Crichton's work, right? Yes. Oh, Scott Crichton, he, he, amazing yeah. book. I've I've read that book yeah. three times, and uh, he was a guest on this show. Am, amazing work. Um, and but you know, Scott wasn't the first. I mean, this has been brought up um, in the past. Uh, well, mm-hmm. anyway, um, that being said. Uh, when we look at the Great Pyramid, it's certainly, and I think you just alluded to this, that quite possibly they were just built before hieroglyphics was a language. Yeah, well, that's, of course, that's part of the, you know, lost civilization model. Um, I actually, you probably don't know this, but I've had long discussions with Scott Crichton on a, on a forum, you know, Graham Hancock's forum. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I th- first of all, I think if you want a prosecutor Scott Crichton is an amazing prosecutor. Yes, he, he is. He lays out a great case. Yes, he does. Um, yeah. I I think where I – maybe where I how I settled this with him, uh, and I don't know if you would agree, but I think he created – he has created enough reasonable suspicion, uh, and, you know, in law enforcement you say probable cause, to warrant uh, a probe. Uh, of course, if that were ever to be allowed, but there is a, you know, there's the second cartouche, the one that's more hidden than uh, the the infamous one, mm-hmm. and that cartouche just disappears behind the uh, the granite wall. The and scene, if, the scene yeah, that is there. Yeah, that's right. So it's up in in the fifth chamber, and so to I think uh, Scott's theory will 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 rise or fall if you probe behind that ledge and you actually can take it, you make a small hole. And you look behind to see if the cartouche continues. And because if it does, then that's not a fake cartouche. And that would probably falsify his theory. Um, but that's how, how you do science. I think Scott is a great, in terms of, you know, in terms of proposing uh, a scientific model and in terms of, you know, testing it, I think it's fabulous. I think that's exactly what you should do next. Um, but at this stage right now, I don't think you can settle the issue. I think there's so much quibbling. I mean, you know, it's I, I witnessed some of these discussions and it gets really personal. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to get personal with people, which is, you know, we're just trying to have a, you know, a dispassionate discussion. And um, I think Scott has made a very forceful case for for a, for a test. And that, that test will make or break this. That book is absolute required reading. I agree. I, it's it's when you it, it the 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 evidence is compelling. He has done the research, and when you go back, and he was so lucky to you know get the original uh, journals and and look at that, um, and and present them, and it's just required reading. You have to go. You can't discuss right. the Great Pyramid without having some general background on this. And Howard right. Weiss is critical to all of this. And right. Scott Crichton does a, a wonderful job in his book. Right. You know, you know, Jimmy, there's actually, this is a great segue to something I just want to insert real quick. I think this, this has to be said. Um, there is no shame whatsoever in being proven wrong. Uh, in fact, that should be an honor badge. In science, if you, you know, this is the way it used to be. You you propose a model and then you try to falsify it. And so because if you can falsify a model, we know more. That's the way you advance knowledge. It, you don't always have to be right. It's in, you know, sometimes it's more useful to actually do an experiment and falsify yourself. And so that's how I look at Scott's theory. You know, it's a great theory. It's a great model. And it actually makes a testable case. And I think that's what science is all about. But, you know, to, to try to, to attack him personally, which I have witnessed this, you know, he's getting personally attacked, you know. And I think this completely misses the point. And this is really unfortunate in, in this field. I, I this because people are so, you know, they're so uh, it's so important to them to be correct, to be right. And say they completely lose sight of the fact that that's not how you do science. That's it's not what science is all about. No, all you got to do is go up to the fifth level with a chisel <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, and answer the question. Yes. That's all you got to well, do. You know, right, right now, there is a, actually a court order that completely see it. This is a crime scene right now. Yeah, I know, because of the Germans. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. This is a crime scene, and so there's no entry up there. Nothing, not, not whatsoever. So, yeah, but maybe in the future when uh, it opens up and maybe then 
It, I don't think it will take much. You just maybe you need, uh, I think, an inch would be enough. An not inch. even that. Not even that. I totally agree. Like I said, yeah. just take a chisel, whack, whack, you know, take a chunk out, take a look. Yeah. Does it continue or right. not? That's right. That's it. <laughs> we yeah. could put, the, put an end to all of this. Yes. Um, but anyway, okay, so now uh, some of the most exciting stuff to come out of Egypt may be uh, eclipsing uh, King Tut uh, is happening right now. And this additional chamber above the Grand Gallery, I think is, uh, I, I talk about it nearly every day on the show. Uh, we were told that there is nothing there. There's nothing more to discover. We all know that's mm-hmm. a load of crap. But right. this this is discovery uh, with the muon scan is about as exciting as it gets. Yeah, this uh, it, it it's, it's a fascinating discovery. Um, there's been one paper by David Lightbody who is criticizing it. He's saying it could be an artifact, and I think the. Uh, the team is aware of it, but I, you know, I mean, of course, I'm not a physicist, so, but I have some science background. So I looked at the paper and I think the criticism is uh, fell short. I think the chamber is real. And the reason why I'm saying that is because there was a detector outside of the pyramid as well. Mm-hmm. And that detector also picks up the, the big void. So I think it's for real. Um, now, as you started to look at this, um you there's something else that you bring up which is the uh how do i describe it i've watched that video so many times the internal ramp uh yes. that spirals around um right. by uh jean pierre the Houdon, yeah yeah and I've, I've i've watched that over and over again i'm not i'm not convinced about that but the notch that is up and I uh, forget what what corner it is. I've always questioned that notch up there. Right, and, it's and, northeast. Uh, northeast, and and you can see it. You can look at any right. picture of the Great Pyramid, and that notch is right there. It seemed if I uh, climb the Great Pyramid, I'm going straight there first on my way up. I'm I'm walking in there. <laughs> I'm serious too. Um, you, you, yes, fall, uh, walking in uh, Bob Breyer's footsteps, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. He was that... up there. But by the way, I just want to say, so Jean-Pierre Houdin, very, very gracious, uh, uh, reviewed the paper that I just published, and he critiqued it, and it was very useful. And, you know, I, of course, I acknowledged it in the paper. Um, so to your point, I think he has not been falsified yet, Jimmy. Um, uh, it's because the spaces that he's proposing are probably too, too short to be able to show on a muon scan. So just to give you an idea, the positive control for the muon experiment was done in the bent pyramid. And in the bent pyramid, they picked up the upper Corbell chamber. That's right. Uh, they laid out the detector plates on the, on the lower level, and they were able to pick up the upper chamber. But the upper chamber, you know, my hunch, I, I was trying to get the exact measurements, which I didn't have enough time. My guess is about 20, 30 feet high. So, and, you know, the overall bent pyramid is, I think it's 200 cubits, which is something like 350 feet, I think. So, um, so that that is the amount of space you need to be able to get a positive signal on a muon scan. And then the negative control goes back to Luis Alvarez and um, Ahmed Fahri in the in the 60s when they scanned. So I don't know if people know this, but the muon scan, a muon scan was actually performed on Kafir's pyramid, and they came back short. So they said they the reason why they scanned Kafir's pyramid is because saying, well, we have all these chambers in in uh, you know Khufu's pyramid, but we only have Belzoni's chamber in Kaffir's pyramid. There's got to be other chambers. So they they laid out the detector plates in those days. Of course, it was a little bit more primitive, but um, they couldn't come up with anything. So they were able to see the casing on the tip. They saw that. Uh, so they were sort of gauging how sensitive the technique is, but they couldn't see any chambers. So that's the negative control. Positive control is bent pyramid. And now let's go back to the Great Pyramid and, you know, Houdin would his spiral ramp show on a muon scan? And I'm not sure it would, Jimmy. I'm not sure. Really? I, think, see, I, I think he hasn't been falsified yet. Ah, see, this is the thing. If if the internal ramp theory... Now, what we're talking about, everybody, is what Jean-Pierre suggests is that 
inside of the walls of each side of the pyramid is a spiraling hallway that uh, ramp that went all the way up, and that's where they carried the stones. Um, I would think that we're, we're talking about a very large structure here, that it would be at least partially evident on all four sides. We would see something there. You, it depends on it depends on where you put the detector plates. Well, certainly, but they would pick up something somewhere. They found, uh, you know, three anomalies so far, plus the uh, 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 the new. Uh, I almost said the new grand gallery, <laughs> the new chamber above yeah. the grand gallery, and right. they are able to do that not only with muons but with heat signatures too. And I would think that that right. same thing would show up. With these right. ginormous ramps, right? The problem, okay. So the problem with the muons, the grant, so the the big void. Yes, there's a positive signal, but it's surprisingly, you know, how should I say? It's surprisingly small. I, it's a huge space, but if you look at the actual data, it's not such a big signal. You know, when I mean, I'm used to when, when I did molecular biology. You know, my professor was saying, "I said, don't even talk to me unless you have an at least a twofold effect," and that is not a twofold effect. Okay, if you look at the trace, so um, so I'm not so I'm not so sure that this uh, the sensitivity of this of this of this type of scanning. But the way to overcome it is to put the plate somewhere else. So, for example. If you put the detector plates up in Campbell's chamber, you know, which is the fifth relieving chamber we were just talking about right. with the cartouche, you actually are cutting out about two-fifths of stone from the path of the muons, and you probably have a much higher uh, uh, signal-to-noise ratio. So I think that is the next step. Um, and, of course, I have a surprise for you Um which we can talk about in, in a few minutes, um, something I saw that um, – Sounds like they're looking for that. Well, no, actually, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna let you do that to me. Okay. <laughs> so, no, let's discuss that because when we come back, we'll get to the deep the part paper. of of okay. your paper, and okay. and we'll spend that whole site. What did you see? Well, the scan. There's a new scan in progress. And and you were well, of course you were there uh, two weeks ago. Is this when right. you saw it? Right. They 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 have uh, laid out detector plates in the grand gallery. Ah, well, okay. Now see, uh okay. Uh what did you see exactly? Well, they have these these detector plates, they're uh, rectangular wooden boxes mm -hmm. and they're covered. Um you know, that's because you have tourists going in and out all the time, so they're they're lying on the on the rails, um, I, you know, I think that's what you call it, on the left and right side. Mm -hmm. As you go up the stairways on the left and right side, there's sort of a, a, a small little ramp, right, where the where the spaces, where the um, in where between the, the stairs are. and the wall, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. You've seen it, and so yeah, so you have, uh, and I counted them. I think it was, um, I remember vaguely, twenty three boxes up and down uh, the gallery. So. And and I actually I, I mean I thought they were detector plates, but I asked a guard and he confirmed it. Yes, that they are scanning again. Is there cabling? N no, I, I didn't see any cables. Okay, wow, that's exciting. Now, yeah. uh, okay, so if they would be going from, okay, so the detector plates are there. What about on the outside of the pyramid? Is there any evidence of? Didn't see it. Right. Because wouldn't the detector plates have to – you have to have them on both sides? Well, they, they, they are basically aiming for – you know, the, the Grand Gallery, I believe, is 26 and a half degrees. Um, and so they're aiming for, uh, I guess, the north – the northern uh, the northern sky, right? Right. The Grand Gallery is leaned – uh, is going from north to south, and it's uh, it's uh, and it's leaning about twenty six and a half degrees. So you lay out the detector plates; they're basically aiming for the northern face of the pyramid. And what's interesting? Yeah, I know, but uh, exactly. Don't, but don't you have to pick up the other side of the muons? 
Uh, well, you're interested in the in the in the uh, trajectory, right? So you have the muons coming through the pyramid and then at different angles, and then what they're doing with those detector plates, they are you know they're measuring the impact and they're also measuring the angle. Right. So the so you know let's say you have an oblique trajectory and then the muon goes obliquely through the pyramid and then it goes into the detector plate at a certain angle, mm-hmm. and that's how they and then they process the data and they know you know where the where the radiation came from and oh. then if there's a space in the pathway, it'll speed up the transmission, and you get more muon signals in in those trajectories that are crossing a space. Right, and so and that's going so that's north to south. So they're they're, I guess they would be detecting east to west. Well, yeah, from oh, the coming in from, coming I, in I, from I thought, the top. Yeah, wow. That, yeah. So I wonder yeah. what. Okay. And that and, is, and and also, if that is the case, and I'm assuming the detector plates are facing in the opposite direction, they're not facing each other, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Right? right. They're facing they, they, the opposite direction, so they would be covering half of the pyramid on each side of the Grand Gallery. That's right. They're they're basically, uh, um, you know, they're they're looking up against uh, northern. Side of it. And you know, this may not be the only place. I this is just what I saw. There's it's it. If I were them, I would put the plates on the in the into the um, relieving chambers. Um, and who knows? Maybe they did. Have you seen? Uh, we've got uh, two minutes before the break. Uh, have you seen the Dassault video on the construction of the pyramid? You know the yes. the French yes. the French aviation company. Yes, I have. What do you think about that? I think that's one of the. I do not know why that is not discussed more and openly debated. That's one of the right. most fascinating theories I've ever seen put forward. Yeah, he basically the Grand Gallery is a logistical passage, right? As a as a counterpoint to lift up the stones, the grant, the heavy granite stones. I mean, you know, it's a model. It I. This, this is what science is. You you propose a model and then you test it, and the first test uh, ostensibly falsified it. This is what I'm trying to say. So, the first run at it says that you know no spiral ramp and this whole thing. Maybe not all of it, but at least the spiral ramp portion of it may be falsified. But with the stipulation that maybe the test wasn't sensitive enough, which is why I think. They're doing this follow-up experiment to see if they can now see it. Well, uh, also, yeah. also in the Dassault video, <laughs> they suggest an exit out of the king's chamber, right? Yes. So you come yes. in, you seal it off, you drop it, right. you have the you know the trap doors, right? You seal right. it off, but those guys, the workers, had to get out. Right. So there's an exit which is right behind the sarcophagus, and there's a stone there that's a different color. Than all of the other granite that is in 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 the king's chamber, and that's, that's the stone that they put in place after they exited. Next to the grand gallery is an exit uh, ramp and hallway that goes down and 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 leaves the pyramid at ground level. Right and now, and then there's two there's two secret rooms according to Houdon. Two secret rooms, and now what I find interesting about that. Is well, first off, that stone is definitely a different color. You can look at any picture, and that thing stands out like a sore thumb. But yes. in this new muon uh, test, if it is where, if it is what you're suggesting, up and down the grand gallery, would wouldn't they be able to detect that hallway that was suggested by the Dassault study? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I can tell you, so the answer is maybe not, because in the Bent Pyramid, they were not able to detect the passageway. Uh, right. They only saw the chamber, but not the passage that connects the chamber to the one below. And so it looks like the chamber is just not enough space uh, to make a difference. And in this case, I wonder if the chamber is just too short. I mean, too too short. Um uh-huh. Are you uh, sure you'd have to scan it in its long axis? If you did that, you probably you might be able to see it. Are you sure you're a dermatologist? <laughs> I need to look at your CV a little bit closer. Let's take a break right here <laughs> because when we come back, that's always been the big question, and I love it when Zahi Hawass is famously quoted: "There's nothing to see here. There's nothing <laughs> to see here." 
Well, right. there is much more to see inside of the Grand Pyramid, and the Great Pyramid will be discussing all of that with Manu when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black, night one of our Egypt week. I'm your host, Timmy Church. More with Manu after this short break. Stay with us. Church Radio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. Your contact for current news and trending topics, KGRARadio.com. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized Wave Moisture Control Unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the Wave Unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is gone. Wave Units require no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no-maintenance Wave Unit. Call 888-717-WAVE, 888-717-WAVE, or visit dryhealthyhome.com, dryhealthyhome.com. Ride the This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. So are you tired of being tired? Well, then it's time to get the tea. Hey, it's Lisa here to tell you about this all-natural, all-organic tea I've been drinking that has had great results for over 20 years. It's called Life Change Tea, and it's specially formulated to help detoxify and cleanse your kidneys, liver, colon, and blood all at once. The colon is one of the most ignored organs in the human body. The faster that waste is eliminated from the body, the less time that waste sits in our intestines, spreading toxins to our bloodstream. This tea helps cleanse chemicals caused by outside intruders from our entire digestive system. And get this, weight loss can be a side effect. And with continued use of the tea, you can experience clear, healthier, younger looking skin, increased energy, and a happier outlook on life. So if you're tired of being tired, get the life change tea at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And like me, you'll be glad you did. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. 
This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What an amazing show tonight. Our guest... Manu Saifzadeh. He just published a paper today. Now, this is, uh, I've read through most of it. Uh, uh, it, it. It's compelling. Some of it is way above my pay grade. It's a fascinating read. Manu, where can everybody, or can anybody have access to this? Yes, it's free, free access. Um, Archaeological Discovery Journal. If you just put that into the search engine, it'll take you to the website. That's the easiest way. I'll have it on my website maybe by tomorrow. Uh, and it's also on my Academia uh, EDU uh, profile. So there's different ways. But the easiest way, Archaeological Discovery Journal. And the title of the paper? The title of the paper is... Uh, that's a long title, so I have to. That's why I let it. I handed it right off to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's uh, it says Hemiuno used numerically tagged surface ratios to mark ceilings inside the Great Pyramid, hinting at design spaces still hidden within. So it basically, basically, the conclusion of this paper. I'll just give you the bottom line right now. Is I am proposing that there is at least six design spaces inside the pyramid, Great Pyramid. Um, and these six spaces are above the Granite Tower. So we're talking about the top three-fifths of the pyramid where there's no known spaces at this, at this time. And I'm saying, based on this analysis, there's at least six, maybe ten design spaces. Now, okay, man, Zahi Haiwas, his head just spun around. Um, <laughs> now, th- it has... He might know. He might already know. I, right, right. And certainly with uh, the Muon uh, paper that, uh, again, uh, su- suggests that there is a, a new chamber above the Grand Gallery where there is allegedly supposed to be nothing, right? Okay. Right. Your paper is taking this a giant step uh, forward and outside of the box, even from the Muon suggestion. Yes, these spaces are above the Great Void. And you're and now, okay. Let's we're going to break this down as to uh, why you have come to this conclusion. One space, yes. two spaces, one thing. Now we're 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 suggesting between six and ten. Now, to come to this conclusion, you have to have something to base this on. So let's right. start with the very basics here, and let's talk about the thickness of the blocks for each layer of the Great Pyramid. Let's start there. Right. So um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment about that, and then I'm just going to present two quick concepts, and then it'll be really easy to understand this. So to your point... If you stand in front of the pyramid, and this, of course, people look at it all the time, and you could come 20 times, and you might not see it. But once you're aware of it, it's actually completely obvious that the thickness of the courses changes. Uh, And it's not a smooth ride up to the pyramid. You know, you would think that they gradually get, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller, but that's not the case. They suddenly get thicker. And then the thickness tapers down, and then it gets thicker again. So it creates sort of a, a wave effect. And this, this, this term wave, this comes from Jean-Pierre Houdin. So he actually emailed, when he emailed me, he, he put it in that term. I, called it, I call it a feathering effect. So the pyramid's texture. And you know, when you see the light show, it's even more obvious because you have the lasers hitting you know, the, the pyramid in certain angles, and then you can really see it, this feathering effect of the, of the texture of the core masonry. Yeah, after, reading, after reading your paper, I went back and looked at all of the high-res images 
uh, that I could find on the Great Pyramid, and now it is obvious. Yes. It's it's obvious, just like when I found out uh, about the eight sides on the pyramid instead of four. Yes. I, I it, it's it's right there. I can, I can see it in any image now of the Great Pyramid. Yes. Now yes. that you have polluted my mind, right? <laughs> yes, it, it, it's rather obvious. How was this not discovered before? Not necessarily why it is there, but just the simple fact that it is there. Well, it is, so it it has been described um, and measured, as a matter of fact, by Flinders Petrie. So he described the he described this varying coarse thickness in his uh, eighteen, I think it was eighteen eighty three. Uh, publication. Uh, and for those who don't know, Flinders Petrie is, you know, considered the grandfather of archaeology. So he's a British surveyor who went to Egypt in the 1880s and he did meticulous measuring of the monuments. And one of the things that he did, he basically measured the thickness of each course from all four corners going up the pyramid. And he plotted that um, as, uh, uh, you know, as a function of the overall height of the pyramid. Um, and so, and then he, uh, he just, so he's, so he noticed that and then he noticed something else. And this is really the key to this paper. Um, and so before I mention this, I just want to, uh, present two simple analogies. So, and then it'll be much easier to explain. So a pyramid. So the first one is think of a pyramid as a stack of squares of shrinking squares, and and then imagine, you know, the bottom square is, of course, the base. And let's just call it, you know, five by five, a square that's five units, let's say five yards, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And so it's five by five is 25, right? And then you pick any square uh, higher up. And so it's a smaller square because it's a stack of shrinking squares. And let's say pick a square that's two by two. So that's four. So we have four. And we have 25, and so that that ratio is 4 25ths. And the 4 is a round number, um, and uh, and then let's give you an example. Let's say 3 by 3 is 9, divided by 25 is 9 25 So 4 and 9 are round numbers. They're integers. As opposed to, let's say, 2 and a half by 2 and a half. So we take another square up the pyramid. It's 2 and a half by 2 and a half. It's 6, 6 and a quarter. That's not a round number. So, so I just want to make that distinction because that becomes important. So when we divide the surface of a square up the pyramid, divided by the base, and we get a certain ratio, uh, if, it's, if it's a round number of fraction, it's you know something like 4, 5, 25, 6, 25. If it's not a round fraction, then it's something like 6.25 or you know, 3.37, some, you know, some uh, uneven number. So that's the first thing. The second concept I want to explain is the pyramid angle. So in, in ancient Egypt, the pyramid angle was called the seret. And what the seret is, is basically you're walking up a staircase, right? You take a step. Each step takes you a step higher, and you're also moving forward, right? So mm -hmm. you basically are going up and forward. And if you have a staircase, each step is the same. That means, you know, you are basically going uh, the same. You're going at the same rate each step. So... That is sort of the angle of this staircase, and that's called the seret. Now, but with this feathering effect, you're not, you don't have even steps, right? So each step is different. You go, let's say you go up a step, and then the step is deeper than the previous one. So it's an uneven staircase. Nobody would ever build a staircase like that, but the pyramid was built like that. Um, it, basically, each course is not a nice, even step compared to the previous one and this is it's a strange phenomenon and so in this paper i am basically i i i looked at petrie's numbers and petrie marked specific courses with these round fractions of 25th and when you look at those courses it turns out that in the lower portion of the pyramid they tend to coincide with ceilings of spaces in the pyramid so we have we know the spaces we have uh, a queen chamber we have a king chamber we have a grand gallery and then we have the tower above the king chamber and it turns out when you look at those courses that are round numbers of 25ths okay they run through that level in the pyramid that coincides with a ceiling of a space of a known space and this pattern goes all the way up the pyramid. And based on that numerical code, I'm saying there, has, there have to be spaces in the top 
portion of the pyramid. Why? Because there is an economic cost for building the pyramid like this. You don't, like I was just saying, you don't build a staircase with uneven stairs. You just make every single stair the same height and the same depth. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, but they didn't do that. They they varied the course thickness, and that's an economic cost. That means he had to basically whoever you know designed the pyramid had to instruct the quarrymen to cut stones with different thicknesses, and then those thicknesses, those thicker stones, had to be transported up the pyramid. So it cost more effort, more time. Why would you do that? Well, the best way to explain it is that when you have a ceiling, you have to protect it, and so what you do is you design the space, you you close the space at the top, and then you you buttress it. You basically put a few thicker courses above so that the ceiling can hold under the weight of the pyramid above. I'm looking at, uh, I, I don't know what it, I don't know if this is uh, labeled. Everybody's going to go and look at this, but uh, the section of the passages of uh, the Great Pyramid with the ratios in red, well, black and blue too as well, on the outside. And the correlations are pretty obvious here, Manu. Yeah, I think I, I, there is, you know, Jean-Pierre had some good comments. He he wasn't totally on board. Um, and so he made me dig up uh, another uh, uh, illustration. I mean, first of all, Peter's illustration is very, very accurate, I think. Um, but I compared it to another illustration and I can pretty much match all of these courses. There's one discrepancy, course number 42, um, but otherwise, I think it's pretty tight. Um, and so it's uh, – it, uh, and the good thing is it's a testable hypothesis. I mean, you know, all we have to do is scan the top portion of the pyramid, put the detector plates a little bit higher up, and we have the answer. And we might have the answer in a few months. And then we can say safe side was right or wrong. Now, let's, uh, let's clarify again. Uh, uh, let's get back to the basics here. At, we're talking about each layer of stone, starting from layer one at the bottom, is perfectly level and, uh, and, and measured as level. There's been enough laser and digitizing of the pyramid and showing that uh, over time this, the level, level uh, to Earth has not changed. They are all perfectly level, and the stones themselves are leveled. What you it's, are it's, suggesting is that some of these levels, the thickness of the stones is different from the preceding layer and matches up with known ceilings and anomalies on the inside of the pyramid. Right. I mean, the, the most, uh, the best example that anybody can see from, you know, standing in front of the pyramid is course number 35. When you stand in front of the Great Pyramid, you look up, you know, about, you know, something like 20 degrees up, you see this definitely much thicker course, and that's course number 35. And it turns out that course sits right on top of the ceiling of the Queen Chamber. Um that's a that's the easiest one to see, and it's also uh, the top of the yeah. grand gallery. It is part, uh, yes, it it sort of, yeah, it sort of crosses. Yes, it's, of course, it crosses the grand, grand gallery, but it doesn't coincide with the ceiling of the grand gallery. But it perfectly correlates with the ceiling of the queen chamber. Right. So, so what I'm saying is that the architect made that course that way because he wanted to insert a chamber at that he wanted to finish the ceiling of a chamber at that particular level now let's go up above uh the the fifth relieving chamber what are you showing here right so this is course number 84 um and 84 runs across the top of the granite tower uh, now, there's an interesting thing about um, – I don't know if we have time to go into this, um, but I'll just mention it real quick in passing. So there's an interesting thing about the 8th, 825th, and 525th, those, those particular courses, because they're not really round numbers. So it's not 8. It's actually you know a, sort of an uneven number, and the same is with 5. But the other, no, the other ones all the way up are pretty tight. And Petrie, of course, marked all of these particular courses in his in his illustration. So, how do you so you know? So I was trying to explain this, and 
My explanation, and of course I could be wrong, but my explanation is, you know, I'm, uh, I talk about in the paper how eight and five are theologically important numbers to the ancient Egyptians. It has to do with astronomy. It has to do with the cycle of Venus versus the cycle of Sirius because um, that's an eight to five correlation. And the architecture shows it. So you can go to my doom pyramid compared to the great pyramid and they're related by five, eight. So five and eight are important numbers. Um, uh, and there's more examples, so we can, you know, we probably don't have time to get into it. But anyways, so in this sequence from 1025ths all the way up to 100, 1, 125ths, the 5 and 8 positions are uneven. And so what does that mean? So my interpretation in this paper is that those are special courses. Why are they special? Is this, Are they special because there is a space or because there isn't a space? So the way I'm interpreting it is that it's a space that's hidden, that's not supposed to be known. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you go uh, – so because the Granite Tower really wasn't a known space – um, and it might not be the granite tower. It could be the possible the, – the, it could be the big void, actually. So it turns out that number 84 crosses a, above, just above the big void. And if the big void is real, then that is what may be designated by that particular course, number 84. So it's not the granite tower, actually. It's the big void. Yeah, I'm looking at it here and, go, and moving up above that. Uh, yes. The the numbers um, and the ratio between them. This is my visual. I'm not looking at the math, but my eyes are saying that there is something consistent here with 89, 97, 107, 115, 129, 143, 161, 179, and 195. That something is consistent here. Now, all of this. This is to the audience. This is all above. Uh, the granite tower, the relieving chambers. Right. Yes. So my, what I think is going on is there are, so there are six, I think there are six spaces, but there's two spaces, the 825th and 525th, they're special. They had some special meaning to the architect. And I think that is where we're going to find if we're ever going to be able to see inside something mind-boggling about this pyramid uh something that that so the this the great pyramid has not revealed all of its secrets and i think the key to the secret of the great pyramid is in those two levels there's two ceilings i think of two small chambers and that's where the money is now which not, uh, the, not I, the money money the money in terms of the right the, cult, the cultural treasure basically and and what numbers are we looking at here what what are you thinking um it would be eight so eight twenty fifth. so i think the big void is potentially the first one and the second one is number 107 uh so course number 107 is is the is where the surface the surface ratio is five twenty fifth five twenty fifth yeah right and so it turns out it's not it's not a round number five twenty fifth it's an uneven number and the numbers are in the paper um, so I think those two are special all the other spaces they could be logistic Jimmy I don't know uh, so I'm saying six spaces maybe there are logistic spaces maybe so I you know I said to Houdin maybe this is circumstantial evidence that the internal ramp theory is still alive and maybe the scan will corroborate it um you know so that's one way you can interpret it but i am more focused on those two specific levels five and eight twenty fifth and five twenty fifth because i think there is something there that the architect wanted to hide well but then uh 129 and 195 are also very interesting to me too as well and i've often thought that there must be something at the top of the pyramid. Yes. It would also exactly be the right. easiest thing to build, too. You have less rocks up there that yes. you're putting into place. Yeah. Absolutely. If I were, cool, if I, if let's say, well, let me be open mind. Let's say whoever built this pyramid, whoever wanted to make this statement, if I were that person, he or she, I would want to be inside the top somehow up there so i can see the world from the top of the that's pyramid. right that's right yeah now, it's almost you know it's bizarre that there was no easy way to get to the top you built this mountain and then there's no way to get up there and you're when you and when you are up there you're seeing 
you're practically seeing the circumference of the earth. You've got an unobstructed view, north, right. south, east, and west. And wouldn't you want uh, that, how do I say, that, that panoramic, that cinematic thing to be part of who you are? Right. That's, yes. you know, that's why everybody climbs to the top. <laughs> right. And, you you know, we have sort of proof of exactly what you're saying, because Jedefre, you know, Khufu's son, he built a pyramid on a on a on a hill just, uh, you know, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers to the north. He wanted to be up there. So so there was something about being high. High up there. Um, so if he wanted it, why didn't uh, Kufu want it? That's exactly right. And now, okay, let me ask you this before. I'm gonna, can I keep you for a little overtime tonight? Sure. Okay. So two more hours, Jimmy. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do a, two hours of <laughs> overtime. Um, now we this is uh, we have a two D or a one D or a two D representation here. We have the height, right? We have the positioning of the height. What about triangulation to now find the position of the chambers? Yeah, so the – well, remember, so the, the course is marks uh, in, in this model, marks the ceiling of the chamber. And by the way, this is also what Rudolf Gunten bring. I, I have to bring him in because he's really the one who first described this phenomenon that the design – is focused on ceilings, not ground, not the not the ground level. This is a very important concept, arch, uh, uh, architecturally speaking. So he's the first one who described it. But he, of course, he wasn't focused on surface uh, ratios. He was focused on distances. Mm -hmm. And in his publication, he's basically saying, uh, you know, that the distances were all multiples of seven and eleven cubits, and there are some prime numbers. Um, and but mo most of most of that design is in the horizontal dimension. This, what I'm proposing, is the vertical growth of the pyramid. So whoever designed this, and of course I think it was Himiunu, you will probably disagree with that because you're saying it was it's prehistoric. But be that as it may, um, the 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 vertical growth of the pyramid had to be also pre-planned. It had to be sort of conceptualized, and I think. That's a good it's an it's something that I wouldn't think about it this way but now that I see it it makes a lot of sense he basically or he or she conceptualized this in in terms of ratios and that way you had sort of a feel for how fast you're going up the pyramid and what's the what's the amount of stone that you need to build a particular level up there and then you and then what you do is when you have a space you have to protect the space and so what you do is you suddenly increase the height of the courses immediately above so you take the pressure off you basically b b uh, bolster against the pressure that's coming from above well there th th that part of it which is is something that i think about often but you know what i'm going to take it one step further there is that and it's very complex and it's heavy engineering even by today's technology Yes. It's crazy, crazy engineering that is involved. But there's one other thing that I can't wrap my head around. And you brought up Rudolph, uh, who is at, I've, I've st still I hold in the highest regard. Yes. The, the um, uh, Rudolph Gatenbrink is that each one of these sections of the pyramid, whether it's the Grand Gallery or the King's Chamber, and all of the uh, of all of the um, shafts that uh, came out of the pyramid, all of that. The stones have to be built around and pre-planned for all of this. Those yes. those shafts exiting the pyramid, they sound simple, but you're talking about 50, 70 layers of stone that are built around each one of those shafts and allow the shafts to be there. Right. I do not understand how that was done. You right. know, it's, unless it's very, and, yeah. and 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 one of the, the, the is that it was built solid and then they bored the shafts out, right? Well, that sounds impossible, but it would right. give you a clean shaft, right? Okay, that's, right, that's, right. That's actually that's a great point you just made, and Guttenbrink said that that would cause instability. So 
exactly what you just said. They couldn't do that. So they did it the hard. They had to do it the hard way, which is what you first said. They had to construct the shafts around piece by piece, piece, by piece with each right. one and and still somehow create a perfectly straight shaft. Right. Now, we're talking about 5,000 years ago. Yes. And I just, oh, man. Right. I, you know, I just, I can't, I, I can't accept it. My mind says no. Well, I, you ask Robert Buval, and he will tell, you know, Robert, of course, you know. He's Robert, an engineer. He's an engineer, and but he, the purpose of the shafts, right? So you just bring an excellent point. You're saying, why would you put this much effort into building these shafts when they're just an air shaft? And that's a that's exactly the problem, right? So I think the only reason why you put so much effort into building the shaft is if it has a really strong there is a there has to be a heavy reason, like you know, a theological reason, something like that, to put all this effort in it. And that's of course what Buval is saying, that the shafts are aiming for uh the stars. Gods, the yeah. stars. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's take a break right here, and uh, we'll just continue the fascinating conversation. I absolutely love it. There's nothing like Egypt talk on Fade to Black, Manu. It's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> I know. Let's take a break right here, and we'll do some overtime with Manu right after this short break. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. We'll be right back. Hey, Manu, uh, are you on Twitter? Uh, no. Okay, Facebook. there you go. Okay, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Church Radio. I'll be right back. Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new Mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new Mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. 
Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and my family is safe because of Numana Emergency Food Storage. Just go to the Numana banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code JIMMY10. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Manu Safezadeh, is with us. We're discussing his paper that was just published today. We'll get the links up uh, to that for everybody uh, uh, after the show and throughout tomorrow where you can go and read this. And, Manu, one of the things, as I've uh, read through the paper a couple of times now, one of the things that is suggested here, which I fully understand, is extreme complex math that has to have been incorporated into the building here. Uh, we're talking about 2550 BC, 26, if we uh, you know go with uh, uh, Orthodox dogma, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but that's what uh, you are suggesting here, and I, I totally understand that and accept that. But the Egyptians... If we understand what Egyptologists uh, tell us, they didn't have this type of math back then. We can't have one without the other. Uh, so how do, how are you going to tackle that criticism when it comes about this paper? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So the math actually that I see here, you know, what I'm describing in this paper, I see that math in the Mastaba of Hemiunu. Um, of course, that's another talk, and, you know, we we can talk about all of that next time we chat. Um, but this is, a, this is a great point. I, In order to make the case that the pyramid was built in the Old Kingdom, um, you have to, really, the gold standard would be to have an, archi- an, uh, an architectural blueprint, which, of course, we don't have. We don't have any written evidence that of the design having been made then. But the fascinating thing is that we may have it in, in a numerical form, and that is the Mastaba of Hemiunu, it's G4000, it's in the West Field, it's one of the largest Mastabas uh, in the cemeteries there, and Hemiunu is the purported architect uh, of the Great Pyramid. Um, and so this math resembles the the numbers that I see in the Mastaba. And, I, you know, again, it's an, it's another talk, we can talk about it, so, but when you talk about complex mathematics, you know, I thought you were talking about the type of mathematics that, for example, Alan Green has uh, described or, or Gary Osborne. You know, I mean, these are great analyses. I highly respect, you know, uh, the two of them. And they would, of course, say there's no way that that type of math was, uh, you know, at hand in this time. Um, I do have an answer for that, but I think I want to let their theory stand for now. I think they make great points, um, and I know you f- you're familiar with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, I think that's the beauty of it. We have a we have a healthy debate. We have a we have a scientific debate between the different parties, and that's the way it should be. Well, we have we have two ways to look at this, and they're very simple. 
either all of the math is coincidence and luck and you could find this kind of fascinating math in in a bar stool, right? If it's elegantly designed, right? you can yes, get right, you can right. get pi out of it. You can get the circumference of the Earth out of it. You could probably get the speed of light out of a bar stool if you sat there and did an a, right. And this is really true with, with a lot of beers, yeah. right? Right, <laughs> certainly. Um, yeah. Or they did have a grasp of uh, complex math and and geometry and algebra and things that weren't proven uh, uh, for 2,000 years, 3,000 years. I'm so happy that you bring this up because this is one of my pet peeves. Uh, There is a third path, Jimmy. So the way you, you just said it beautifully, either it's random chance or it's intentional. But see... I, there's a third possibility, and we have to exclude it. And that third possibility is incidental occurrence. So what is that? Um, an incidental occurrence. I'll give you a simple example. If you design, if you design anything based on a square, you are incidentally also importing the square root of two. Okay. Now the square root of two is an irrational number, and nobody would say that the ancients knew the square root of two, because it's a number that never ends, right? But simply by designing something that's a square, you are also incorporating a diagonal between the corners, and the diagonal is related to the square root of two. So does that mean that the designer of a square building knew the square root of two? No, it means that the square root of two is imported by necessity, but unwittingly by virtue of the design of of a square so that's not random chance and it's also not intentional it's incidental and this is a big big point that i'm trying to convey to my colleagues uh on the other side of this um, this okay incidental uh is fine with something like that in a very basic presentation okay so you have equal sides and to, you know, the, a piece of string created a block that or a room that was per- okay. Okay, I get. I, okay, I can I can wrap my head around that. But then yeah. you bring in the golden ratio, you bring in pi, you bring in the speed of light, or the uh, the, the circumference of the Earth. <laughs> you yes. start bringing yeah, in those, right? those so concepts. That, those, so those are all different cans of worms. You just open up. Okay, so let me just stick for example, just to the just for now, just the pyramid itself. All the math that uh, you pull out of the different ratios of the different dimensions. I'm not talking about my paper. I'm talking about, let's say, what Alan Green would propose. Sure. You could say that all of that math is incidental to the, the pyramid angle. You, you build a pyramid based on the pyramid angle of, uh, you know, five and a half palms per cubit, and you have a pyramid. And that, like the Maidum pyramid, the Maidum pyramid is based on exactly the same angle, It's five and a half palms per cubit. Uh, It's just five eighths smaller than the Great Pyramid. All of the math, and I mean all of it, that you can pull out of the various, you know, uh, observations, you can pull out of the Maidum Pyramid too. And why? Because it's a pyramid based on the golden angle. The golden angle is five and a half palms per cubit. So, So is it random chance? No. Is it intentional? No. It's incidental to the pyramid angle. So this is one way to to open up a third path here. Um, but I don't know. I, I am, you know, I, I love, like I said, I highly respect the uh, what Alan has written, what Gary Osborne and others have written. I respect it because they could be right. And what I'm saying could be wrong. But I just wanted to make this case. I just wanted to make this point that it's not a, dic- a dichotomy. It's not, you know, black or white. It's not two camps. It's three camps. And and if as long as as soon as you open up that third possibility, you could actually explain a lot. Not the speed of light. So you brought that up too, and I want to make a comment about that too. That is one of the few riddles about this pyramid: the position on the globe. And the the uh, the latitude, the numerical uh, identity with you know the speed of light number that is mind boggling. And I have not I have tr- I have a video on my YouTube channel trying to explain it with this third pathway that I'm mentioning. But I I am the first to tell you I have not succeeded. I actually went to the 30th parallel in in Cairo on my last trip. I I wanted to see 
what that looks like. And you know what, Jimmy? That is an archaeological site. I bet you there's something under that ground exactly at the 30.0000 degree latitude. Uh, in, because that's exactly where the meridian crosses the 30th latitude. It's 10 pyramid lengths uh, north of the Great Pyramid. So if you take the Great Pyramid and you move it 10 times north, you're exactly on the 30th latitude. And there's one other point. Let's uh, Well, there's many points, but let's go back to what you said, uh, which is paramount. We don't have, if, if, this, if the pyramid was done today, we would have a warehouse full of blueprints and design and engineering. It right. would be a ginormous project, uh, hundreds of drawing boards and computers and, and, and pencils, right? I mean, just a crazy right. amount of, of thought and, and, and expertise put into it. Clearly, we don't have that. So that would suggest that there was one brain behind the pyramid that is literally, uh, in all of these sites, that is building... Uh, uh, on a whim that is telling everybody what to do, that everything is in somebody's brain. Yes. It's, it's not drawn out. And I, I, I can't accept that. I, I, no, I, I, can't. I agree with you. I, it's, 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 it's remarkable. And of course, you know, cosmic womb, uh, Robert is proposing one of the ways to, he explains it is that it's an entanglement. There's, it's a message from outer space it comes from some self-aware intelligence, far more advanced than we are, and it basically inserted this brilliant idea into the architect's mind. And this is, in other words, this whole thing is a one-person genius, and that genius designed this structure. Um, that's one way you can explain it. And and you know, I remember sitting with bre- we had breakfast with Robert, and we were discussing, you know, the different ways and and. And he has, a, you know, he has, as always, he has an amazing way to think about these things. And I, I, I felt myself. I had, to, I had to. I agreed with him. I said, you know what? You're right. This is possible. Um, this is just a strike of a genius, and it may, it may come from an as an exterior source. We, the way that physics goes nowadays, and what we know about the cosmos, uh, I think this is on the table that explanation well we have to try to figure out how this this intelligence just surfaced at 3000 bc in egypt right suddenly they went from one phase of of living in in the desert and surviving to virtually overnight having this knowledge and it wasn't just the knowledge of construction but it was agriculture, it was religion, yes. it was government, it was taxation, it was laws. It, it, a lot of things came into play here uh, yeah. all, all overnight. But there's there's one other thing that complicates it uh, for me, yeah. and it is the building of it, certainly. But we've got to go back uh, to the foundation and that these were perfectly oriented north south east and west uh yes. i mean not not perfectly but frigging perfectly right. okay and leveled and the knowledge of this of building a foundation from an engineering standpoint is something that we are still coming to terms with today how to build yes. a skyscraper, how to get the foundation, how to get the footings, how to get the engineering right. All of that is stuff that we deal with every single day. We're learning it today. Back then at 3000 BC, apparently it was pretty easy. Right. Yeah, for, that's right. Well, if they, I mean, of course, there is proposed models, either the sun shadows or the stars were used. And the pretext also, I'm, I wrote about this in one of my papers, the Pyramid Code, the origin of the Pyramid Code, which came out last year, is the, the reason, potential reason why pyramids were suddenly oriented in the north-south direction is because the star al from the, you know, the Big Dipper, the Hoof Star, which uh, is what, you know, Robert wrote about this, that the Joser Pyramid, the Serdab, where the little statue of Joser looks through the little peak holes, right? Mm-hmm. That that is oriented tall. It was oriented towards Alcate, the star, um, and so it turns out that 
uh, and this is based on the work of Juan uh, Belmonte, is that it's possible that arcades disappeared. Uh, it became it was no longer imperishable. It was not a star that was always visible every night. It suddenly became, and this is due to precession, so all of a sudden that star dipped under the horizon so the Egyptians couldn't see it. And that was a, you know, sort of a, uh, a paradigm-changing phenomenon. And so what they did is they started orienting their pyramids now instead to Thuban, which was the, the, the North Star in that time. And the first pyramid that was oriented that way was a small step pyramid next to the Maidun pyramid. So if you go uh, west about 10 kilometers from Maidun, there's a small step pyramid built by Sneferu. And that is the first pyramid that was oriented in that direction. And there's an astronomer, Giulio Magli, uh, you might know him. He is actually, they, they did a detailed orientation study of all Egyptian monuments. And I think these pyramids are all, you know, measured. Um, but to your point, the Great Pyramid is the accuracy is mind boggling. It's incredible. Um, and yeah, it, you've, if you want to make the case that they couldn't couldn't have done it, I I'm not going to put up a fight. No, no, they couldn't <laughs> have done it. But but yeah. uh, there's the other part of this. Um, and both theories can't be right. OK, and that is this. If they were doing if this is what's crazy. If they were aligning to the stars. And yes. and getting true north out of the stars, which, by the way, today, true north and the way the stars were 5,000 years ago. Now we're actually off by a degree uh, or two. And I and so I, I have a hard time dealing with that. But the other point is they, if we're talking about doing it in the dark. And mm -hmm. I, I just I, you are lining up 13 acres of land right? yes. <laughs> with stone that is being laid as the bedrock for the Great Pyramid before the, the pyramid was even built. And yes. that foundation was leveled and orientated true north at night? Well, wait a minute. It just, it just, it, it, it doesn't work. Or they did it with water during the day. And I understand yes. that idea too. But both mm -hmm. can't be right. See, do you understand what I'm saying? It, it 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 just doesn't make sense to me. You mean you mean because one one method was during the day and the other one was yeah, at night? Yeah, yeah. You're leveling during the day and then you're straightening it back out at night to the star. Yeah. Wait, it just no, no. I'm sorry. It's just, yeah. It's it's way too um uh 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 um what's the word? inaccurate it's not accurate well i you know what I, I i'm really looking forward to tomorrow night when christopher dunn is going to be on your program and you know he knows of course Mar uh, martin eastler he knows uh, uh dennis stock and uh you should ask him that question he's uh if was it possible for them to do it i i'm i can't wait well, Here's see, if this is, and the, and I'm going to ask you about this. What the the historians of the world, whether we're talking about Egyptologists or archaeologists or anthropologists, it doesn't matter. They're all going to tell you the same thing: that uh, at 5,000 BC, 4,000 BC, 3,000 BC, that was Stone Age man. That's yeah. it. That was Stone Age man. So they uh, and and then they will suggest. Well, you're not giving them enough credit. They were actually smarter than than. Oh, wait a minute. Was it Stone Age man or not? That's the first thing. And yeah. how smart were they? And then the flip side of it is you're asking us to accept that Stone Age man had grasp of of all of these concepts. Of, of heavy engineering, of astronomy, of all of this. Now, you can't have it both ways. And that's what they are asking us to to swallow. And I'm not, yeah. that's why I go with, it wasn't stony, it, it wasn't the Egyptians that built it. That's all that I'm saying. Well, it, it, so this is what I would say. I mean, let me put, put myself in the shoes of an Egyptologist. They, would, they might say to you, Jimmy, is if you look at First Dynasty Mastabas, they're incredible. Um, they were probably just as mind-boggling as the pyramids, and they were built in the first dynasty, uh, you know, on the hillside in Saqqara. Abydos. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, in Abydos, yes, I, I, I yeah, hear you. Yes, right. yes, and, I understand. And so even, and even uh, you know, uh, one of those or two of those actually had a small 
precursor of a pyramid over the burial chamber. So, for example, there's a queen of Jair. Her name was uh, Harry Knight. And hers is the southernmost mastaba on the uh, on the Saqqara Ridge, and it's a first dynasty queen. And her 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 must her mastaba is huge, with the you know with the paneled facade and with the bullhorns in the front. It's they're mind boggling, and so that um, that burial chamber had uh, had a pyramid like roof. So this is so you know an Egyptologist might say, well you know what they did, there is sort of a gradient of gradual technology technological advance and it leads up to the pyramid age you know you have the step the small step pyramids mm -hmm. then you have then you have just oh, i'm sorry you have joseph's pyramid then you have uh the other step your sechem uh, what's this uh Sechem and chaba the and red pyramid the, sure right and then and then all of a sudden you have the maidum pyramid and then it gets cased that's and and uh, and for and then before that you have the the Ben pyramid which gets cased. So they would say there is a gradient, but you know what I I but I agree with you. At some point you still have the same problem. How did you get the stones up there? Um, right? How did you how did you finish the pyramids in this amount of time? So it's always the same question. So I I completely accept at this point both sides of this equation, and I think it's just. You could both be right. Yeah, I, I, when, I, I'm reserving my judgment. <laughs> this is, and this is, uh, this is my funky way of looking at that. From Saqqara, you can see the Giza Plateau, right? And yes. so, why not? It, it's a very simple thing. Your your primitive culture, right? First Dynasty. You're looking across the desert at the at at the Giza Plateau, and you're trying to imitate what you are seeing. <laughs> I know. It's a good point. That's I, that's I, it. You're you're trying to replicate right. that, and they never pulled it off. Right. That's, so, it's, so, it's that simple. It's not the other way around. They built their way up to it. And the, the the other thing is this: it's simple math. When I look at the construction period of all of the pyramids that were built before the Great Pyramid and the Plateau, now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that were doing nothing but building pyramids all the time. Right. That's it. That you didn't have an you you didn't have another gig in Egypt. Everybody there was building pyramids. <laughs> right. right? And they were going from building site to building site. They were building these things every 5 or 10 years. Right. You know, right. and there's you know 75 pyramids that were attempted before the great pyramids. I, I I just don't see the, the amount of quarrying and transporting and feeding and and yeah. everything else that had to have been in place. That math doesn't work for me. It's a pretty good economic stimulus program, right? Yeah, nobody had another gig. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, well, you know man. what? I want I wanted to uh, underline something you just said. I have actually a great example for you know you said Saqqara. They 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 saw the pre existing pyramids and they tried to imitate it. Mm -hmm. I actually saw something like that next to the Sphinx. It was uh, it was incredible. I I walked up to the Mastaba of Kai. Uh, it's a rock cut tomb. It's the most bizarre tomb I think in all of Giza. And I'm standing in front of this tomb, and I think I'm looking at a lion face. And so, and you know, and Colin Reeder has done great work there. He's basically shown evidence that that tomb or that that rock is is not fourth dynasty or fifth dynasty rather. Uh, so Kai was a son of one of uh, I think Mankawar's wives, um, but he's saying that that was a first dynasty construction, and it was used by Kai as a as a tomb later. Um, and that would be an example potentially if that is a lion face. And I showed it to Robert Schock uh, a couple of nights ago, and he he was shaking his head and laughing. We were both looking at this picture and we were saying, "Yeah, man, that's a lion face." <laughs> so, I mean, when you go to Egypt next time, Jimmy, you got to look at this tomb, tomb of Kai. Stand in front of it, and you think you're looking at a prehistoric lion, and that. And but but it's dated to the first dynasty, and so that is so a good example of what you were just saying. That could have been an imit an, an act of imitation. They saw the Sphinx, which of course was sitting Mehit was sitting there right. for thousands of years, and they see that and they try to build a tomb right next to it that has the face of a lion. What a fascinating conversation tonight, Manu. I can't wait to uh, to get you back on the show, and 
will continue all of this. Um, I, I hope that you are prepared for uh, the the comments and what is about to follow in the days and weeks ahead <laughs> sure. uh, following the publishing of this paper. I mean, you know, that that's what you do. You've got to uh, roll that rock uphill, and this right. paper is fascinating. Thank you so much. You were amazing to me. Thank you so much. And Have a I good night. Yeah, absolutely. And enjoy the rest of your night. And I can't wait to get you back on the show. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Manu Sefzadeh. Unbelievable conversation. Now, we will get his paper up. Uh, I've got I've got the real paper here. I've been blessed. But we'll get the links up to where everybody can go and have access to it. It's unbelievable. Tomorrow night on the show right here, Christopher Dunn for night two of our Egypt Week here on Fade to Black. Manu, stay right there. I'm going to talk to you after the show. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitola, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast zone and copyright in 2018 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. They cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Until tomorrow night, Christopher Dunn right here. I want everybody to be safe. Go Backley Tappy.